Good morning and welcome to the biggest your favorite weekend current affairs and political analysis program. My name is Godfred Akutobwa for your regular host. And it's been a week where the economy of Ghana has come to the fore. There have been protests, there have been police clashes with some citizens, but all in all, it's Ghana's intent to go back to the IMF that carries the big headline. And that is where we'll start from on the big issue today as we try and break down what this uh, letter of intent that the government of Ghana has sent to the IMF in Washington means for the government and its economic policy and, of course, the economy in general. We'll also look at the fallout from the Arise Ghana demonstration that took place this week, uh, the political cost, what it means, what indicators does it send. All these things are more coming up on The Big Issue. Welcome back to City 97.3 and City TV as well. Like I said, it's always an interactive show, the big issue, and you can reach us via WhatsApp line 0549986996 to contribute 0549986996, 0550585832, You can also reach us via our social media handles on Twitter. Those of you like Twitter, I love Twitter. So at City973 is the Twitter handle, or you can reach me at East Sportsman Godfrey Aputo Waffle using the hashtag the big issue. One word, the big issue. Hashtag, okay? And I will gladly read your comments, suggestions, and comments. We're also live on Facebook, so you can share that stream. Very important as well. City TV GH and City 973. You can leave your comments as always. I say let's remain civil in our comments. Let's be responsible uh, with our comments. And if indeed you do miss out, don't worry. You can catch us on our YouTube channel, CityTube, C-I-T-I-T-U-B-E. When you get to the first thing to do, subscribe. Type in the big issue and you can catch a playback of all the issues and the analysis that you have missed so you do not miss out on anything okay so to start the conversation it's the the, the, in the course of the week there has been considerable debate well in fact it's been building up for the past two weeks um discussions about whether ghana needs imf support or not up until yesterday the government had said it did not need the imf the government had said that it was going to rely on its own homegrown solutions to deal with the economic difficulties that the country was facing. That position changed yesterday when the government announced its intent to engage with the IMF. And so we will try and do a catch up with what the government has been doing with a bit of a report to put things into perspective. So we'll hear from the finance minister, we'll hear from Ghana on the IMF, we'll hear from the former president, John Ramani Mahama, uh, all in a small report just to put things into perspective now once we are done with that we'll come back in studio and uh, begin the analysis and then i will introduce uh, my guest to you after this so uh, let's catch up with ghana and the imf we'll be back but i can tell you as um, uh, my colleague um, deputy minister said we are not going to the imf whatever we do we are not the consequences are there. We are a proud nation. We have the resources. We have the capacity. Don't let anybody tell you. Like when Joshua, Caleb, and, and the 10 others went to spy on the promised land. And only two of them came to say that we can do it. And the 10 went around the community, murmuring, you can't, da, 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 da. We are not people of short sight, you know. 
then we have to move on. Okay? So let's think of us as who we are, a proud, strong people, the shining star of Africa, and we have the capacity to do what we want to do. If only we can speak that one language and show that we better and share in the issues ahead. Clearly, the issue of Ghana uh, having the capacity um, to think through the consolidation exercises and also discipline itself with regards to the 20, 30 percent cuts, etc., that you, we have shown um, clearly uh, a direction that I guess, even in a sense, um, uh, the fund may be hesitant um, to. Um, um, to, to push um, any further with regards to that. It is well known to every economic and financial watcher that the real problem with our economy is not what we do not have, it's not that we do not have enough money to spend on priority needs requiring more borrowing, it is that we have borrowed too much and a chunk of our revenue is going into servicing that debt leaving very little for anything else. If this revenue were free and available to us, we would be in a much better place to meet many of our needs and the rigidities and the attendant consequences on all sectors would have been eased. It is evident, therefore, that the solution to the problem lies with taking the bold steps to restructure our debt, to get some relief from pumping far too much revenue into debt servicing on an annual basis and channeling the savings into priority areas that will benefit our people direct, directly. The Akufado administration knows this too well, but political posturing, empty grandstanding, and a morbid fear of their own pedestrian politicking around less serious problems of the recent past have immobilized and frozen them into action, inaction which continues to run our economy aground and worsening the living conditions of our people by the day. And with this, I'm referring to their criticism of my administration when we decided to go to the IMF. They said it's only lazy governments that go to the IMF. And I mean, the words they said in that past have come to haunt them. So one of the reasons why they're afraid to go to the IMF is that what they said in the past will uh, follow them. The directive by President Kufado to the finance minister follows a telephone conversation between the President and the IMF Managing Director, Ms. Kristalina Georgieva, conveying Ghana's decision to engage the Bretton Woods Institution. According to the Information Ministry, the decision to go to the IMF was taken at a meeting on June 30, 2022. The engagement with the IMF will seek to provide balance of payment support as part of a broader effort to quicken Ghana's build back in the face of challenges induced by the COVID-19 pandemic and recently, the Russia-Ukraine crisis. The move comes on the back of a multiplicity of issues affecting Ghana's economy, including a worsening public debt situation, which has risen to about 391.9 billion Ghana cities, or 78% of GDP as at March 2022, rising inflation, which has risen to about 28% in May this year, high fuel prices, city depreciation, among others. Former Finance Minister said Tekwe, who has been calling on government to commence discussions with the IMF, says the move is long overdue. By this time, we have analyzed that two of our expenditure lines, compensation and interest, were taking virtually all of tax revenue, which the first quarter proves clearly for this year. So I was saying, given this, uh, we might probably want to consider external assistance because a lot of external assistance had poured in through COVID. Okay. So that was my position. Now, so I was asked firmly, you know, is IMF an option? At that point, I said, yes, it's an option. But then government came in categorically and said that we were not going to go to IMF. And I said, if we are not going to go to IMF, then give us alternative. What is the alternative to the IMF? You know, that is, and so anytime I was asked, particularly for this year, I said, look, Government had taken a decision that it was not going to the IMF. Okay, so what we need now is alternative. And in the absence of alternative, we are only waiting for the situation to get worse and to make the discussions, you know, more difficult.
The Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, ESA, has meanwhile described government's decision to seek an IMF bailout as a step in the right direction. Speaking on the move, Director of ESA, Professor Peter Quote, noted that an IMF bailout will bring policy credibility and boost investor confidence in Ghana. That we've gotten to this stage, uh, we have no option than to look for the second best option, that is to get the IMF to help us get some credibility and also help us put our uh, house in order. So I, I, I think we've reached a stage where we ought to develop our own programs and policies that will then prepare us to engage meaningfully with the IMF. So it's not like a top-down approach where the IMF will bring us um, documents or will bring us policies to implement, but it's going to be a bottom-up approach where Ghana would have to prepare its own policies and programs that it wants the IMF to fund. We, we certainly have to stick to whatever we propose to do with the IMF. Um, whatever fiscal discipline we said we're going to do, they will help us achieve that. Um, it will also ensure that um, there will be some credibility in terms of uh, within the international space, international community will see that yes, there, there is indeed um, like the headmaster in the block who will ensure that we are going to do what um, the fiscal or the hard choices um, that we should take, but we are having difficulty achieving them. So the yeah, IMF will bring um, some um, respite to us, but it also comes with a cost. Um, some of the uh, flagship programs and some of the um, earmarked um, expenditures will have to be trimmed down. There has to be some, some reshaping of some of these programs. So what does industry make of the move? Said Chuma Kwabwa is the CEO of the Association of Ghana Industries, and he says even though they wish we had not gotten to this point, we as a country do not have a choice. He believes industry needs the stability that an IMF program would bring to the economy. At some point, you don't really have much choice. It's just like if you're on a sick bed. If you're on a sick bed, you take a bitter pill to be able to get out of the sick bed. And at this particular moment, we have challenges in the economy. And, 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 and some internal, some are external. We all know the recent challenges we've had with the COVID pandemic and the Ukraine war and the Russian war, and maybe our own internal uh, uh, challenges and discipline and all that. So all have accumulated into this. So the state we've got into, um, I think that it's a good decision and a good choice to make that we need some bailout. And the bailout is necessary to give confidence back. As you rightly said, when confidence level is low, it affects speculation. People speculate into currency, people speculate into economies, people speculate into all kinds of things. And that affects our, 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 the strength of our currency and all the implications that go with it. So at this particular moment, when you are having rising costs in terms of fuel prices, rising costs in feed, rising costs in inputs, and, and so many things, then you really need some stability. And going into IMF, if it will help bring stability, why not? I think at this particular moment, what industries need is macroeconomic stability so that we can plan and predict. We can, we can have reasonable range of inflation, interest costs, and so on and so forth, so that we can do our business as normal. But at this particular moment, we are having challenges, and therefore it is just proper that government intervene and comes up with some uh, uh, policy solutions. And if the solution is going to IMF, why not? I think we should embrace it and, and welcome it. In 2019, Ghana exited its last IMF program, but in less than three years, the country is headed back to the Britain Woods Institution for a bailout. Despite the fact that the matter was not officially on the order paper of Parliament, Deputy Majority Leader Alexander Fenyomarking broached the issue on the floor. They were trying to create by this candid decision by government through a statement issued honorable, by the Minister of Information. It's as though they know nothing about IMF. You have been to the IMF, Mr. Speaker. You honorable were not confronted Mr. by an international crisis. You went to honorable IMF because of this money. Why are you not telling us that we are going to IMF? When you moved, Mr. Speaker, don't need a space. Mr. Speaker, when they were in government, there was no international crisis. You went to IMF. 
Other MPs spoke to City News on the matter. Just last month, the Minister of Finance organized an encounter with the media, and you heard him right. He said, whatever it is, the last thing they will do is to go to the IMF. So I was surprised when I saw the government is now running. They're not even walking to uh, IMF. They are, they are running speed to go to IMF. Just a couple of hours ago, Muhammad the Messiah told them that, look, go to the IMF. And I'm happy that you have listened to him. One thing left is that they should fire the Minister of Finance. Because Mama added it to the recommendation that he made to government. And if they don't fire him, we are not going anywhere. He will mess up whatever bail out, the, bail out that we are going to get from IMF. You know government will say that I want to impoverish the lot or uh, make people live uncomfortable for their citizens. You know government what is sought to do that. But certain circumstances beyond your control will lead to some hardships we, which we all agree to. So, Clearly, the MPP government has taken a bold decision to engage the IMF in a way that Ghana can get a program, obviously to implement that will in a long way bring about the economic stability that we all want. I've always said that Ghana first. I'm first a Ghanaian and second a politician. But I want to reiterate the fact that this administration has unfortunately delayed too long. It has taken them too long to take a very simple decision and to work very hard to get a program. What they've done today is something that anybody at all can do by engaging the IMF. What is critical is you get... So that was Kassala Tufos in wrapping up that report. And just to catch up with the statement that came from the Ministry of Information uh, announcing this so that we get it clear, you know, exactly what the government was looking to communicate before we begin the discussion. It was a pretty short one. Uh, Minister of Information, the President of the Republic, Nanado Danko Kufuado, has authorized Finance Minister Ken Ferrata to commence formal engagements with the International Monetary Fund, inviting the fund to support an economic program to put together by the government of Ghana. This follows a telephone conversation between the President and the IMF Managing Director, Ms. Kristalina Georgieva, conveying Ghana's decision to engage with the fund. At a meeting on June 30, 2022, Cabinet indicated its support for the decision. The engagement with the IMF will seek to provide balance of payment support as part of a broader effort to quicken Ghana's build back in the face of challenges induced by the COVID-19 pandemic and recently the Russia-Ukraine crisis signed by Kujopong Kroma, Minister for Information. So that is how uh, Ghana ended up uh, announcing uh, its uh, the start of its engagement with the IMF. Okay, so let's come in studio now and uh, try and make sense of what is happening now. Um, for perspective, this is not the first time. If it does happen, this will be the 17th or so time that Ghana uh, will be going to the IMF. Um, we'll try and catch up with all that in a bit, but let me just introduce my guest. I'll be doing this with Dr. J.K. Kwachi. Uh, Senior Economist Institute for Economic Affairs. He'll be joining us via Zoom. Uh, Professor Lord Menza, uh, State Professor with the University of Ghana Business School as well, will join us. Uh, Joe Jackson with Dalex Finance will join us. Dr. Stuart Chiampong uh, also will join us. Uh, former Deputy Minister of Finance and current uh, Member of Parliament for Cape Coast South is here with us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, Mr. Alfred George Thompson, the former Deputy Managing Director of the National Investment Bank. Uh, so that tells you he's a banker, so he knows, he knows his money. Uh, also in studio <laughs> with us. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Good morning. Man. It's a pleasure to have all of you Thank with you. us to discuss and the IMF and all that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kisigan has started quietly. <laughs> but let me begin the conversation uh, with Dr. Dr. J.K. Kwashi from the Institute of Economic Affairs. Dr. Kwashi, good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for um, joining us. And I guess I will, I will start this session with what you gleaned from the announcement that emanated from the offices of the Minister of Information. Then perhaps I will take it from the process thereon. So what, what, what do you glean from the statement, first of all? Hello? Yes, sir, Dr. Kwachi, can you hear me? 
Yes, I can. Can you also hear me? Yes, I can. So my question was... Yeah, yeah, um, I got just, your question. Okay, all right. Let's go then. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, this uh, decision announcement, you know, came as a uh, surprise. Dr. Patrick, just a second, if you could please put yeah. on your video for us. Thank you. We're just no, getting... I'm not, I'm oh, okay. A... All right, all right, then. So let's go. Let's go. Not go. In a to put on the no video. problem. No problem. So let's go. So if you can hear me, then that's fine. Yes, we can hear you. Let's go. Yeah, I said that uh, the announcement, you know, came as a, as a surprise to, um, I'm sure, a lot of people. I mean, it came, it came so quickly. Um, I would have thought that uh, for government to arrive at this, uh, you know, decision, they would have done a lot more consultations uh, with, with, the, with the Ghanaian public, you, you know, because we are all part of this process. I mean, whatever decisions are going to be made, finally, will affect, you know, Ghanaians. So... I would have thought that um, the government would have done a lot more public engagement um, before coming to this decision. That is one. I mean, secondly, um, you know, the announcement, um, you know, is, is, is so short. I mean, as you read from the uh, Minister of uh, Information. And so it doesn't give us enough information as to, uh, I mean, why we have decided to go to the IMF. I think some kind of explanation should be given to Ghanaians. I don't know whether that is going to come later, but the sooner we get it, you know, the better. Is it because we are in a situation where people are, people are taking, taking different decisions, I mean, positions? You know, some people want us to go to IMFs, others said we should not be going and all that. So if government has arrived at this, you know, decision, they should have given us uh, enough reasons, I mean, to convince Ghanaians why they decided to go to the IMF. That, that is also missing. Uh, so those are my, my preliminary remarks. Um, I think we okay. can go into more detail uh, you know, as yes. we go along. And, and I'm, I'm going to stay with you on the IMF for a while because you've worked extensively with the IMF. So if you can just walk us through what happens next. Ordinarily, once a country starts formal engagements, what does that mean and what happens next? Okay. You know, the IMF will always welcome a country coming, coming to them, you know, because that's the job that they do to, for, for their assistance. So I'm sure that very quickly they will put a team together um, and then and they'll send them down to Ghana to sit down with our, our authorities, you know. Uh, and I, I believe that our authorities would have put together their own program you know, which uh, they will take to the IMF, they, they will present to the IMF for, for consideration. I think that, that is very important. I, it is not good enough if they don't have their program and they expect the IMF to come and uh, design their program for them. I, I, mm. I, I, don't, I don't believe they will do that. Okay? So they, they will go into the, the details, you know, as to what exactly, you know, needs to be done. I mean, they will identify the problems that, that, that we are facing, you know, and then also come up with, uh, with uh, solutions. But, so they will negotiate uh, between them. But I know, you know, the IMF has a standard, you know, program. Um, I mean, what they try to do is that you, you, now you are facing serious uh, financial, you know, uh, crisis, I mean, imbalances in the economy. So the IMF program essentially is designed to, you know, uh, bring things into balance. I mean, restabilize the economy, you know, uh, and then give you uh, the kind of uh, policy credibility that you you cannot um, on your own um, uh, secure it from the international community. You know, once the international community knows that the IMF is working with you, then of course they will give you the kind of trust or confidence that you need. I think. The problem that government is facing now is that, you know, even, even though some of us have suggested that um, maybe they should design their own home grown program and they may, they may not need to go to the IMF, I think the, the problem government is facing now is that they are not sure of the confines, the exact confines of the program that they will put together. That to, you know, allow them to get the kind of trust or confidence uh, from the international community. You cannot be sure what exactly should I do to secure that confidence. But of course, when the IMF comes in, the international community has the trust in the IMF and so on. So they, they will then accept that once the IMF is with you, 
you know, you, you, are, you are going to do, you know, the right things and so on. And I believe that they are in such a, a serious a financial, you know, I, I mean, situation uh, that uh, they can't go to international financial market. The CD is depreciating, you know, very fast and they are car strapped. So you, you also need some financing, you know, as a bridging kind of a <laughs> facility. So these are the, the, the broad confines of, uh, you know, what, what uh, the, the engagement with the IMF is going to be. Now, what kind of timelines are we looking at uh, once the letter of intent is sent and the formal engagements begin? Uh, does the mere mention of or the mere start of the formal engagement mean that suddenly we are on the mend? What, 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 can you share what timelines normally we would be looking at in a, situ a situation like this? You know, IMF is, um, you know, they have the benefits of having information about you. Is it because we, we, we provide the, you know, periodic uh, data to the IMF on the economy. So they, they know the economy, you know, very well. So they know where you are. And I'm sure that even before government made, made this announcement, they have been having some kind of uh, background kind of, uh, you know, engagement with the fund. So the, the way I know the fund, uh, they, they will put together a team very, very quickly. In, you know, in fact, in the, in the next one, within days, you know, at most one week. And, 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 and they will come down, you know, they will come down very quickly to have uh, the, the kind of engagement with, uh, with the government. But the, the point is that once you make this announcement, you know, the markets then immediately, you know, uh, begin to, well, it, it, the announcement alone will help stabilize things. Because the, once the markets know that, oh, you are going to even be uh, talking to the IMF and you are going to get a program with the IMF, at least it will help stabilize uh, some, uh, I mean, the situation a little bit. In other words, the kind of disinvestment that uh, people are doing and that you cannot have access to the international market, things will stabilize until... Even though the putting together the, the program will take some time, at least you will get some respite, you know, whilst you are doing the negotiations from the, the kind of confidence and the trust that you are going to get from the, the international market. Now, let me put you in a bit of a squeeze, if you don't mind. What are your personal thoughts on this decision? Last month, the government said, no, we would not go to the IMF. Two weeks later, here we are. Yes, you know, if you remember, I had taken uh, a, a position that um, we did not have to go to the IMF if only we would take some kind of very bold measures. When I was, we had made some uh, suggestions, you know, um, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are out there. Uh, but um, so this uh, decision came to, to us as a, I was already even preparing a press briefing for next week, you know, where I was going to elaborate more on the things that uh, we could do ourselves you mm. know oh yeah certainly but, but you see because we 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 have everything as the if you put the playback that's the, the, the some of the you know the the, the the speaking i mean the speeches that um, minister has made and the government you will see that not long ago they were saying that we have everything we have the resources we have everything you know, to do things uh, our, uh, on, on our own. So how, how come that very quickly they turn around and say and said, you know, now we now we're going because we have the resources in this country. Okay, if you look at uh, our nat natural resources, you know, mm -hmm. we have abundant resources there. Why are we not tapping those resources? And even when it comes to revenue, we are not collecting enough revenue. Okay, so why should we become suddenly so much uh, cash trapped? We are not collecting enough revenue. The exemptions, the property taxes, you, 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 you know, um, illicit financial flows, um, mis, mis, uh, invoicing of trade, and, and, all, and the money laundering. If you check all those uh, you know, lapses, you know, you'll be able to increase your revenue envelope you know, substantially. And then, of course, you go to the revenue side and try to, you know, rationalize the revenue okay, cut down some of the waste uh, especially the, the the expenses on some of the you know flagship programs and so on if you cut 
you know, down some of those uh, expenses, you are going to be able to build, you know, get a, if, I, if not a, even a surplus, you know, a de, I mean, fiscal surplus, at least, you are going to narrow the deficit, you know, and then build uh, enough buffers. You see, the, the problem with these countries is that we have not, over the years, built enough financial buffers, economic buffers. You see, so that's why we are in this kind of situation. We don't have any financial buffers to fall on when the, we, were, we were hit by these external shocks. Well, it's not only Ghana that has been hit by these external shocks. Our peers, you know, in Africa, elsewhere, they've all been hit by these financial shocks. But those of them that had built enough buffers will be able to accommodate these shops, you know, much better than, than, than we have done. All right, then, Dr. Kwasi, thank you for your initial thoughts. Um, hold on for me. Let me talk to Mr. Joe Jackson from DLX Finance. Joe, good morning. Good morning. Good to be on your platform. Great to see you. Um, and a shout out to all your listeners and viewers. Um, as always, a pleasure to have your rambunctious personality with us this morning. But, Joe, let, let's get to it. You have been making this call for quite some time now. A bit too late, you think? Uh, uh, first of all, it's a bit late in the day. You, you see, you don't you don't wait till um, you have a, a a sore on your toe. You're a diabetic. You have a sore on your toe, and um, when you go, they'll cut off the toe. That's what the doctor says. And you say, I don't want my toe to be cut off, and so I wait, I wait. But the time I get to the and the next time I go to the hospital. It's my whole foot that must be cut off at the ankle. I still resist. Very mm. soon, my leg is going to be cut off above the knee. Or worse. I think we've, 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 we've known that we, uh, okay. we're heading in the right direction. And if we could have fixed mm. this ourselves, we would have fixed it long before all this came to the head. Simply said, we can't fix these things ourselves. We don't have the discipline. We don't have the willpower. We are hamstrung by partisan politics. Throwing a bit of corruption. So, hey, we're going late. But better late than never. How late are we? Oh, fairly late. Remember, the longer you wait... The more torturous the the the, the 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 engagement and the agreement with the IMF is, the longer you wait, the deeper the hole that you are in is growing. So uh, uh, we're pretty late in this phase. Listen, there's one important thing we all have to realize. Mm. Think about what the the head of state, Nana Abdodankwa, His Excellency, has been saying about going to the IMF. Think about what the Minister of Finance has said. Think about what the Deputy Minister of Finance has said. And the list goes on and on. The political backlash of going to the IMF was definitely going to be there. As such, if they have, at this moment, accepted that this is the only option we have then things must be bad really 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 bad and that's why i said it's late in the day because as recently as last week some people were saying we will not go so if these same people have done made a turn around then the situation they are looking at must be so dark that they are prepared to face the backlash but joe i i, I must ask you it, this you, yeah, go ahead. Some of you had been making this call for a year now, perhaps, or more. More than a year. Yes, a year now <laughs> or more. The people who sit close to the numbers in the positions of power, in the halls of power, looked at their numbers and felt confident that they could deal with the situation. H how bad do things have to get for them to make this kind of turnaround within the space of three weeks? Okay, now, I think here it's about our behavior. Some of us have felt that 
the way our trajectory, the way our politics, the way uh, the populism that, that determines our, our politics, some of the hard decisions will not get taken. And we're talking about hard decisions, hard decisions, hard decisions. You need the IMF. You need the IMF for credibility. The thing is this, one of the challenges I have sometimes is this. Of course, you can do it locally. But when, as, uh, uh, if you're not able to do it and you get to a crisis, you don't have credibility. And if you don't have credibility, the investors that you need to bring in the inflows will not happen. So why are we surprised that you get to a crisis and you only need external help to reassure people that you're doing things differently? All the IMF signals is this, that we are ready to face up to our issues and to submit to a certain kind of discipline and a certain kind of review and a certain kind of accountability. If we could have done this ourselves, it will never get to this. But why can't we? And that seems to be a running theme. I've heard it from Dr. Kwachi. I've heard it from you. And we've heard it all this while we cannot seem to discipline ourselves when it comes to our fiscal situation. The IMF are the ones who have to come and help us instill that discipline. You're a man of finance. When we say discipline, why do we lack that discipline? It's the kind of politics that we play. Listen, our politics are characterized by extreme partisanship. Our politics are characterized by populism, to quote the public. Throw in corruption, and you've got a, 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 huge, a fatal mix of explosive issues. If there's partisanship, hard decisions are harder to take because everybody will use it against you. And we will not look at the issue on the merits of the issue. So what happens? We keep kicking down, uh, kicking the can down the road. We postpone taking the hard decisions. And we think we can borrow forever. We think we can throw money at it. But at some point, you have to show you have discipline. If the issues are polarized, how do you take the hard decisions? If you need to be populist to court the public, how do you take the hard decisions? So the reason why some of us think that in this current dispensation, the way it's turning out to be, that we will still go, keep going to the IMF, is that there's an inbuilt factor that makes it difficult to take the hard decisions. Now, Look at how, how mm -hmm. difficult this decision has been. It's been difficult because if you had gone to the IMF, instead of assessing the issue on the merit of it, they would have had, there's, there's a huge political backlash. That's what is happening. It's the, it's the politics of the day. Let me ask you this. Um, there are those who have said, and I'm taking you to the man at the front of this, who have said, or let me just put the question straight. Is the economic ideology of the finance minister a problem? Listen, I don't think the economic ideology of the finance minister is a problem. We all know what it is to be done. Remember that I'll take you back six years ago. When the finance minister came to power, he talked about fiscal discipline. He talked about the lack of fiscal space. He talked about raising revenue. Go and read the first budget statement of 2017. Those issues are all clearly laid out. The things we have to do to fix our problems are not rocket science. They don't require uh, 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 an economist from the IMF to come and tell us what to do. We know what to do. But knowing what to do and doing it, that's where the problem lies. So... It's, it's not about ideology. On both sides of the divide, we know what to do. Go and read the President Muhammad's statement. 
it's it's orthodoxy about how to fix the problem when you read the the minister statements it's all about the same thing except when you get to power the politics change the equation look at our uh, our, 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 our every uh, uh, party when it's in opposition prescribes the best medicine knows the best let's wait for them to get to power and then things change i don't think the problem is the ideology of the of the finance minister or or, or, or anything the, the 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 what we have to do is 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 textbook stuff it's not rocket science it's not what we have to do to fix the economy does not require uh, a, a Nobel a Nobel Prize in economics. <laughs> All right, Joe. Let me hold on for me there. Let me uh, talk to Sio, and then I'll come in the studio and talk to Mr. Thompson and uh, Ricket Hagan, and then go to Professor um, Mensa. Sio, good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning, my brother. Ah, it's been a while. Yeah, no, doing doing well. Except that we we'll find ourselves in. Uh, very challenging times, and I, I cannot help but align with a lot of the thoughts that Uncle Joe has shared. Let, let me just ask you this. My, my, I, I'm reading a, something here, and it says the IMF, it, the IMF doesn't like basket cases. Are we a basket case? Uh, no, I don't think we're a basket case, but we, we are almost there. For me, the worrying thing is that um, you can literally replay this conversation six years ago, uh, you can go back to uh, in the 2000s, and you can even go back into uh, Lehman's time in 1979. I am a, a student of economic history, and what is really interesting is that um, when you go back and you look at the historical paradigms, you can always pretty much you know, find a one-to-one -one, um, similarity in terms of the issues then and then what took us subsequently uh, to the likes of the IMF. So this one would have been what, if we eventually sign it, this is going to be our 17th time since we've been to the fund. And if you look at uh, the 60-something years since independence, literally every kind of three and a half years. So if you assume a four-year political cycle, literally every three and a half years, we're running to the fund for one form of support or the other, and which for me tells me that the problem is much more fundamentally structural and what we need to do to fix it i think most of us around or on this table know what is required to be done even the politicians know what is required to be done um but the the space for the policy debate and the politics of it is actually preventing those really hard decisions that that need to be that need to be made but i i don't really agree with the point that we we have become a, a basket case let, let me ask you this. What, what is it about the IMS reputation that scares politicians? And, or it's just this situation that created this scarecrow reputation for the IMF? I, I think you need to look at it uh, in, in twofold, right? The historical disposition of the IMF coming from the 60s, 70s, 80s, where a lot of people who did the applied uh, work uh, with some of the structural adjustments, etc., find evidence of, for example, countries entering into such programs uh, facing more inequality, facing um, deindustrialization, and things like that. And, and those policies subsequently making um, countries, especially in the developing world, relatively poorer off than would have been the, the case. So there's a bit of that sentiment which often, you know, feeds through into the, the policy discourse. But we also need to remember that the IMF of today, in my view, is actually slightly or radically different from the IMF of yesteryears. You see a change in tone, you see a change in narrative. And even now when countries enter programs uh, with, with them, there's even things in there where they're trying to safeguard social spending and all those cuts and, and literally forcing you to do the very things that you should have done um, anyway. So that's one part of the argument. The second part of the argument is actually 
how our own politicians, um, in Ghana's case, both the NPP and the NDC, have literally used the um, IMF or a, a, a dispensation going to the IMF to play a political chaskele, you know, where <laughs> they are looking, they're looking actually at making um, or gaining votes, right? So you see that there's a lot of poisoning of the atmosphere. This person is bad. Uh, going to the IMF means that you mismanage the economy, and you can I can count statements from both sides of the political divide. You can swap one over the other, and that in a way really poisons the conversation. And in my view, also then, um, just like Uncle Joe has said, prevents that really deep-seated conversation that you need to have as a country. Because if we need to get out of the out of these um, issues, we need a consensus approach. We need to bring everyone who matters on the table, which includes the opposition, but in an atmosphere where you have this deeply entrenched and perverse politicization of the issues, then everybody, you know, um, is, 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 is trying to share responsibility. And to borrow mm -hmm. Kujus, we're all like, kicking the can down the road um, in, in that in that word. And so resulting to things like borrowing and debt and euro bonds becomes, you know, a, a, a temporal fix to what otherwise we, we should have been. I have said that in a sense, uh, we have become debt junkies, you know, rather than fixing the, 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 the bigger issues that that requires. From your perspective, looking into your glass bowl, what lies ahead for Ghana? I think we're going to enter into one program or the other. I think what lies ahead for us, for me, I like to go back to um, how we exited the last program in 2019. 19, yeah. And even before that, what led us to, you know, us going into the last program? Because I think it offers some useful insights for us, but importantly also in terms of how we sit at the table with the IMF to negotiate what uh, a proposed program um, would, would look like. So we had issues or challenges with the economy. And in the last program, there were three anchors, right, uh, on it. So the one I'm talking of between 2015 and um, 2019. Originally, we were meant to have exited by 17, 18, but it got extended a bit. The first anchor of that program was to restore debt sustainability. Back then, our debt was unsustainable, uh, and currently, as we speak, is the same sort of thing, right? And within that debt sustainability, there were a couple of details around um, having to take some front loading uh, of your fiscal adjustment, in this, basically having to cut a lot of your spending, um, and there focusing on containing your wage expenditure growth. And if you recall, we even put a, a, a freeze on hiring or net hiring in the in the public service. And then there was also something around um, pursuing some of the reforms around public finances, um, improving budget transparency, fixing the payroll, um, and, um, and what was also there was that they also safeguarded uh, some of the um, social spending. So things like LEAP actually were expanded um, during the period. So that's one. The second aspect of the last program was to strengthen monetary policy. And it's interesting that only three years after exiting that, currently the inflation targeting framework which the central bank is pursuing, in my view, is not working. And if you go back to look at what we sought, we sought to do back then, one of the key things was to end the central bank's you know, uh, deficit financing of, of the budget, because that was one of the major, major drivers of inflation uh, in the country. So that's possibly one of the things that we'll have to look at as well. And then thirdly, the, the last aspect of the last program was actually preserving the financial sector. So we cleaned up the banking system and made it a bit more kind of uh, robust. But the first two points I made on debt sustainability and, and on monetary policy coordination, I think are things that are going to very much on the table in our conversations with, with with the IMF. And what this would do really is to bring some sort of policy credibility 
and, and allow us uh, as a country some breathing room to fix uh, the problems. But my worry is that if we don't have a consensus or bipartisan, you know, uh, or national approach to these issues, we will be back at this table only a few years from now and we'll still be talking about another IMF program. All right. Thank you very much. And Dr. Thua Chiampong also sharing his first thoughts. Let me come in studio then and talk to uh, a banker. Uh, Mr. Alfred George Thompson is a former Deputy Managing Director of the National Investment Bank. So you play with money and yeah. I'm sure you said when you, you heard the announcement, you, you had some personal thoughts, first of all. What were the, I wanted to share those personal thoughts with me, if you can. Ghana back to the IMF, number 17. I'll say good morning and um, I'll say thanks for inviting us here. My brother Rick is all from Cape Coast, so we come to talk. I find he's here. <laughs> Even though he started punching me already. Sometimes you look at them and you see that they have that big smile on their face saying that, yeah, you got them, you told them they are going to IMF. But um, personally, when um, it was announced, I said, yeah, why not? I mean, if that is what is supposed to turn us around within the shortest possible time, then we need it because. Um, in the long term, if we sit down and wait, what is going to happen that, uh, is that in the long term there will be a crash. There will be this um, stop in the economic activities of the country. And um, I don't think that is what we want to happen. I have traveled around recently and I see what is happening in other countries. And I don't think, um, looking at it, we want to get to that stage. So taking this decision at this point is, is a better pill, but it's a good thing that we've, uh, the finance minister has taken up. Mm -hmm. And I believe that once we do it and we do it well, it's a stopgap measure. Mm -hmm. Once we do it well, we, in no time we should be out of it. Because it's supposed to just help you, cushion you, make, making sure, as he said, our debt sustainability, our balance of payment deficits and all these things. We look at it and we make sure that we strengthen certain places within the economy. Once we've done that and we are working out, we work out gracefully and we're happy that, yes, we've gone through. It's not supposed to, it's not a matter of saying that, oh, yes, you've gone there because um, you can't run your economy or because you don't know what you're about. But it's also to put certain checks and balances in place and also to, from time to time, you know, sometimes you need that external mm -hmm. things because what is happening now, let's be realistic, it's a global crisis that is going on. When you read uh, the IMF themselves, the reports they issued in April 2022, and I'll just read a little bit, it says global economic prospects have worsened significantly since our last World Economic Outlook forecast in January. At the time, we had projected a global recovery to strengthen from the second quarter of um, second quarter of this year after a short-lived impact of the Omicron variant. Since then, the outlook has deteriorated, largely because of Russian invasion of Ukraine, causing a tragic humanitarian crisis in Eastern Europe and the sanctions in that pressuring Russia to end hostilities. So it tells you that it's not Ghana being in isolation or Ghana not running its things well. But there is a global thing going on. It will affect certain places. It will hit certain places hard. But at the end of it all, what do we want to see? We want to see ourselves running an economy that is not um, stagnant, that is not um, going into the dandrums, that is not, um, you can say that it's come to a standstill. And that is where you get a lot of um, cues for fools, cues for this, cues for that. Even food becomes a problem. I don't think we want to get there in this, um, after 62 years plus of our Indies. Mm -hmm. And so um, if we look um, in the long while or the long term, you realize that and uh, if we don't take a certain path, what is going to happen is that we're going to get stuck somewhere because everyone thought um, the COVID was going to end within a matter of a year or two. It's still ongoing as we speak now. COVID is still ongoing. Then whilst COVID was ongoing, we get this Russia-Ukraine issues that also came in. So globally, everyone was affected. So you sit back but and you it ask... it seems like us more than most. No, it's not us. Mm. <laughs> it's everywhere. I mean, Belgium recently, they went on a demonstration saying yes. that prices were high. Uh, um, U.S., we know that um, inflation has gone 40% high, uh, um, very high since the uh, last 40 years. U.K., we saw the demonstration that went on there. They are complaining about food hikes and everything. Um, Ghana, when you take our inflation, it's 27% thereabouts. When you take Accra alone out of it, it's 11%. So you ask yourself, why is it only Accra? I was speaking to someone yesterday. I was just trying to put in some... Uh, 
understand certain things that are going on. So one of the ladies that came to see me, I asked her, so how much is a tube of yeah? So it's between 70 to 20 Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. And I said, where you are coming from? How much is the tube? I said, oh, three is going for 10 cities. And I said, three for 10 cities. Um, is it ENG? ENG there about. So is it a transport alone? That will change three for ten cities to one for seventeen or twenty cities. These are the questions that we put in place, and you see that no, there is something seriously wrong here, and we need to see how we can address the Accra issue, the capital issue. So there's that an internal what, problem. There's an internal problem with the capital. It's the capital that is seriously facing these hike in uh, food prices and things, and that is where we need to see how we can adjust it and make sure that when prices come down, a lot of things also come down. Mm -hmm. see, so there are, there are certain things that we need to look outside the box and, and address. But coming back to the issue, yes, he talked about the sustainability and also strengthening the monetary policy, which is the, the, the two key things that um, definitely we'll be looking at. When that, that, that is a problem, is it not? Definitely it's a problem. Definitely, it's a problem because once your debts are always going high, definitely it will become a problem. How do we now um, stop it and then start bringing it low? And how do we also have internal growth? And you see, that is why the president kept on saying that we should look at Ghana beyond it. How can we also do things that people will come back from us, export, and also make sure that we also cover ourselves in all these crises because everything comes to your production level. How is your production level going? How is your balance of payment levels? And you read from the minister's statement or the minister, yeah, the minister's statement that our maintenance is the balance of payment to make sure that our balance of payment is not in the bad situation. So we are looking at all these things on the whole just to make sure that we sustain a situation that will not put ourselves into trouble. We shouldn't sit down and wait. Then when we get there, we throw our hands in despair and say that, hey, what is going on? Whilst we are doing this, we are also doing and uh, putting in measures internally that would also help us cover and make sure that we come out of this as soon as possible. And these are things that definitely the government is looking at. Right, interesting opening comments on Mr. Thompson. We'll hear more from him. Uh, we'll take a quick break. When we return, you'll hear from his Cape Coast buddy, <laughs> the <laughs> member of parliament. We'll also hear from Professor Lord Benson. The big issue will be right back. Welcome back to the big issue on City TV and also on City 97.3 FM. For those of you who want to send messages as we discuss Ghana's return or Ghana's, Ghana signaling its intent to return to the IMF uh, for some relief, you can do so via two WhatsApp lines 0549 986 996, 0549 986 996, and 0550 58 5832 again 0549 986 996 and 0550 585832 for those of you who want to reach us via twitter as well at city 97.3 or at godfrey akotobafu at east sportsman use the hashtag the big issue and i will read your comments as well streaming live on facebook on city tv gh and on city 97.3 as well and a couple of messages have come in just before i get to the honorable rick Hagen. On this matter, um, Daniel from East Legon says, It's good to eat humble pie when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object surrenders. The government and the opposition must work together on this one. Um, good morning, Godfred says, John Sadoboy, who would have thought that the best economic team ever led by Baumia will succumb to an IMF program? Indeed, the fundamentals are really weak. Uh, going to the IMF is not a real headache for the president. After all, IMF is not an avatar that kills. The issue is how the world is going, is going to know the true state of the Ghanaian economy. Edward from Achimota Hills Estate is unhappy this morning as the president must sack the finance minister as a matter of urgency and principle. He is an avowed anti-IMF person in his own words. He should have resigned by now if we lived in another country. Since he's vehemently, going, since he's vehemently against going to the IMF, he is the wrong person to lead the country's current program. I suggest other equally qualified people such as Dr. Sikbiye Boa and others. Uh, Alan in Chantai says, Ken of Rata doesn't seem to understand uh, this macroeconomic, structural economic thing, but it doesn't want to be tagged as a failure. Where we have reached, it's not about bond markets anymore. It's time for serious macroeconomic restructuring and sustainability. You need people with IMF or World Bank backgrounds, no Wall Street wealth management. 
Uh, so Ellen Inchanta, I'm not very happy this morning. Secretary from Hohoi says, isn't it worrying that after 65 years of independence, we still can't fix our problems as a country? This is so sickening. Uh, Dalali from Gawi says, pride goes before a fall, and this government's pride is over the roof. Uh, he's not very happy this morning. And this one says, I'm so sad listening to the first two submissions from your panelists. Are we so incapable of disciplining ourselves economically that since independence we have had to run to people who colonized us on 17 different occasions to help discipline us before we can manage our affairs? What's the use of our independence if we have to continually depend on them while having the best brains in the country? These politicians have failed us. They have no moral right to talk about the black man being oppressed when they are those continuously uh, making it possible. This is coming from Ezekiel. Well, Ezekiel, just a bit of, you know, correction on this. Um, and I think Mr. Rikesi is Rikesi Sagan. When it comes to the IMF, I think Ghana is an active member of the IMF, a paid-up member mm -hmm. of the IMF. So the IMF's role is not really a matter of colonization. It's a matter of economic, global economic stability uh, because nobody wants, you, you need an organization that keeps the balance one way or the other. So it's one of those institutions. But I understand the perspective that you're coming from. But speaking to, let, let me bring in the Anabu Kukuriki Sagan, Member of Parliament for Cape Coast South. He's a former Deputy Finance Minister. He's seen what an IMF program looks like <laughs> from within. So perhaps you can share and he knows. some insight on what it is uh, we, we, we should expect. H have you cited a letter of intent anywhere from the government of Ghana to the IMF like with, with wow. regards to what exactly we are going to do? No, the, what, what uh, I have seen is uh, what has been made available to us oh. by the information uh, minister. Um, good morning to mm. your viewers and uh, good morning to my brother <laughs> from Cape Coast in the studio. Mm. Uh, morning to my good friend uh, Joe Jackson and uh, two doctors, I think, uh, Theo Champon and yes, Dr. Kwachi. Um, and one professor. And, and one professor, yes. <laughs> professor Mesa. Yeah. Um, going to the IMF was, uh, was inevitable. Hmm. You, you could see it from a distance. I think it was in your studio months ago when I said, we're, we're discussing the E levy. And I said, with or without the E levy, we are going to the IMF. What made you so sure at the time? And I will tell you, and that's what troubles me that whether the current managers of the economy actually understand the challenges that the economy is going through. And I did say here as well that the e levy is the least of their problems. Hmm. Because what others, many others could see, it's different from what the government was actually looking at. What was or is our problem? We have a deficit issue that obviously cumulatively becomes our debt. We have um, fewer prices, you know, the fewer challenges that we have, which is the bulk of it is an exogenous, or not the bulk of it, let's say it's an exogenous uh, factor. It's an external thing with crude prices and all that. Then you have the inflation in general, which the fuel cost feeds in and also food inflation. Then you have interest rate recently, which is being caused by the Bank of Ghana because they've taken over the fiscal job, you know, and trying to resolve it with monetary policy. Then you have, this is what, takes, what should take us to the IMF, is to do with the balance of payment issue. Mm. We are talking about, yes, that's, that's, where I saw my going to the IMF from. Because the solutions that they have given us so far did not address that bit. And when you look at the broad balance of payment issue, we are looking at our export revenue, which itself was dwindling. We are looking at our import, import cost, which was going up as a result of the currency. Then we have the currency depletion. Not the pandemic and not Ukraine. No, I'm, I'm just relating them. And then okay. we'll see whether it's a pandemic or is where it's coming from. But I'm talking about the problems. Okay. Whether it is, you know, domestic or external problems. Then you have the reserve, which basically supports some of these things that I've talked about and money comes in. 
Then, as I said, the revenue crisis. Now, as a result of what is going on around the world and structural issues with the country itself, where we don't add values to, you know, things that we export and all that. Our export revenue was dwindling. It's been dwindling for years. Then, on the other side, our import cost, because we spend so much money bringing things into the country, and these are hard currencies, which obviously affect, because you have to mop up the dollars to be able to get these things, which create the currency crisis. And the reserve which is basically money coming in from our export revenue and also from, you know, loans like the euro bond and all that that we were getting to, which was like, those were short-term measures. And then the cocoa syndication money, which was coming in every year, right about 1, 1.5 billion. These are hard currencies. These are not e-levy problems. So... The question is, if you want to support your currency that is depreciating, you need your reserve. That's a textbook. You need your reserves to be able to do that. Now, when you have reserves that you cannot use, but you are using this as a trophy, and by that I mean we have like 7 billion, you know, the government likes talking about, we have 7 billion, you know, uh, what is it called, reserves, which is three, four months, import cover and all that. The question you ask yourself is that what is that money doing? If we have that much, why are we struggling in containing the currency? Why are we struggling in paying our external debt? External debt is also part of it, because mm -hmm. also a hard currency. Why are we struggling in supporting the balance of payment? The answer is simple. In the past, we were getting things like the euro bond and things that I mentioned, mm -hmm. coming into our reserves in hard currency. And I'm emphasizing on the hard currency. So when you have them in dollars and all that, you're able to use it to support your currency. You're able to pay, use it to pay your external debt. You're able to use it to cushion the both the export and the uh, uh, revenue and, and that. Now, if we are not, we've been, we've been downgraded. And as a result, we've not been able to go to the capital market to get this hard currency. And concourse syndication itself was not working properly for us to get the annual 1.5 billion, which roughly is about uh, 4.5 billion, if you take the euro bond they were doing in the last two years of 3 billion. So 4.5 billion was coming into the country every year to support the reserve and all the things that I've mentioned. So if you don't have any option, of how you are going to replenish the reserves or getting money in, but you keep the reserves there and watch the currency depreciation as if you know you are watching a paint dry, then you are going to have a problem. So the question for me was, okay, get the get the uh, e levy. The e levy might help you to maybe clear your domestic domestic debt, for instance, because. If you have the yield levy, probably you would not be going for domestic debt. And let's separate the debt here. We are talking mm -hmm. about domestic and external debt. External debt comes in dollars. Domestic debt in cities. So if you bring in the yield levy, you'll be able to take off some of the domestic debt of the table and replace it with a yield levy. But you haven't got a solution for your external debt, how you reduce your external debt, and all the other things that goes with it. So... You can bring in all the cities you want in the system, whether e levy or whatever that you do. But if you have not addressed the hard currency side, the reserves, the currency, the export revenue and all that, then in the end, you will have to end up at the IMF. What does the IMF was set up primarily to deal with exchange rate. That is the function of the IMF. When they set it up in 1944, that was his job to deal with, you know, that's what we always talk about, balance of payment yes. support. And then later on over the years, IMF, World Bank, they all started pretty much doing the same thing. But their main function, so any country in the world who is a member of the IMF, when you are having challenges with your currency, where do you go? You go to the IMF. When you go to the IMF, IMF gives technical and all other, you know, assistance. When you go to the IMF for that stopgap of getting currency to 
ad uh, for getting hard currency to address your, your problem. Then you move on from there. Over the years, other things have been added as we talk about their sustainability, monetary, and all that stuff that they do. The discipline that we talk about. Why are we afraid of going to the IMF? You ask that question. Mm -hmm. We are afraid of going to the IMF, particularly this government, because of the things they have said about the IMF in the past. But then historically, the 16 times that we, talk, we talked about having been to the IMF, historically, it looks like IMF hasn't really worked for us. The question we need to pause and ask ourselves is that, is this the IMF that hasn't worked? Or it's us as a country that have not really done the things that we need to do? Well, it looks like historically the IMF hasn't worked for a lot of countries. No, I, that, that it's always the problem. It's not only us. Yes. Because the IMF, if you look at the IMF program, why do we go there if it hasn't worked for us? The IMF program is supposed to bring some discipline into your economy. Things that you are supposed to be doing, but you have failed to do. And that is to do with fiscal consolidation. Being able to cut your coach. That's what fiscal consolidation in the layman's language is. You cut your coach according to your size. They talk about rationalizing expenditure and bringing measures to enhance your revenue. That's basically what the IMF program is about. Okay? Now, we go into this IMF, what the economists will call as a, a contractionary policies. Mm. You go into the IMF for these policies, then you come out and start an expansionary policy, which is basically doing the reverse of what you went to do IMF for. A typical example is this government when they came into office. They inherited the IMF from us. Mm -hmm. Right or wrongly, we went. We were bastardized, whatever. They came and took over. When they took over, there was a contradiction between the policy being pursued by the government and the policies of the IMF. We started with this debt sustainability and cutting spending and all that. What did the government do? And pr probably we didn't watch that. The very day we left the IMF was the same day we started our return to the IMF. Mm. Because when 2017, when this government came in, they have a number of flagship programs and all that they wanted to do. This things increases government expenditure or government spending. IMF is to cut spending. So they were doing the opposite. In terms of measures to enhance revenue, what did they do? When they came in, they cut what they call nuisance taxes. Now, taxes are tax revenue. So if you are supposed to enhance, you know, um, tax revenue, and you are supposed to rationalize or cut the expenditure, and you are doing the opposite because you have 1D, 1F, um, free education, which is a good thing. You have planting for food and jobs, and all these programs that cost a lot of money. A bulk of the borrowing that got this government to where they are in borrowing is the money they borrowed into these flagship programs that so far hasn't worked to give them the, uh, the, the, the desired result. So for this reason, it was very clear to me from the very onset that if these guys don't tackle, it doesn't amount whether you are getting six billion or seven billion of, because you are not going to use your domestic revenue mm. to pay for your external debts. Because when you do that, it's inflationary and it depreciates your currency. Because you will have to mop up cities, uh, we have to mop up dollars in your system. That's if it's not coming from export, export revenue. You have to mop up dollars in your system to pay for that. And that will appreciate the dollar and depreciate your currency. So if your strategy is that you are going to get Yi Levy to solve your problems, the problems Yi Levy can solve were limited. And it doesn't touch the external issues that I have addressed. Which brings me to the question I asked uh, Joe yeah. earlier. So the finance minister and his strategy, you have a problem with it? 
I have a problem, and I disagree with my good friend, Joe, okay, because I had a similar, or I came from an investment banking background mm. into the public, you know, and I realized that I learned very quickly because I realized that things are done differently. When you are in a private sector, you know, you are using other people's money, you are the shareholders, you, you know, and in his case, he was even bigger because he owned the bank, mm -hmm. okay, so he made certain decisions unilaterally, perhaps and was not accountable to any public press, to anyone. He was only accountable to his shareholders, some of whom are probably friends and relatives and all that. So his problem is that he has not been able to understand the way the, private, uh, the, the public sector actually works. So the broader picture that I have painted to you, mm. he looks at it from an Europe bond capital market standpoint. But there is a real public finance issues here that you need to address. And you are using the people's money, taxpayers' money. Where you, when you are short of money and you call your shareholder, these are rich people, they can bring you money. But it's not always that you call a taxpayer and you get the money. And that's what the Yi Levy is telling us at the moment. So with all these problems that were created. Also, you have the wasteful expenditure, the reckless expenditure, the lavish expenditure. It's probably not peculiar to this particular government, but it's probably much more bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then you have the lavish lifestyle, which has been going on, you know, that when we say you are taking a 15,000 an hour uh, US dollars flight, now you go for 20. You know, that sort of thing. So, but this probably will be, I don't want to make it political. I want to bring the, 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 yes. the, the let, economics let, of the matter. Let's keep it economic. Economics of the matter here. <laughs> so this is fundamentally the problem. We have a structural problem in our economy that requires a long-term solution. Mm. But we have immediate problems, partly by um, the, the COVID, partly by... Um, Ukraine, Ukraine, you know, but what these things have done is that they have exposed the structural problems that we have in our economy. So they are not the structural problem. And, sorry? Well, if you listen to the government's idea, so yeah. do, because the government's narrative, the final paragraph, build back in the face of challenges induced by the yeah, COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, they're going and to blame. Recently. Because what they are Christ. doing now is that they found someone to blame. COVID, Ukraine war. Mm -hmm. The next, you know who they're going to blame next? When they go to the IMF, the blame will be on IMF. That will be the IMF. Will come, yeah, they will say, because of IMF, we can't do this. Because of IMF, we can't do this. Which is not even true. Again, another thing that makes us find the IMF a monster. You have two minutes. Yeah. A monster two. is that yeah, we, we talk about the yeah, IMF. <laughs> we talk about the IMF as if IMF is the one causing us the problem. Okay, when you have a public sector workforce of 600,000, mm -hmm. what do you know your public sector should actually be? We've been going through these ghosts and all these things. 400, you know, I'll tell you, we did some biometric things and, you know, we are still this, where we are. When you have 400,000 people who should actually work in your public sector and look for opportunities to create jobs elsewhere with government programs, you decide to load it to 600,000. 200,000 people are not being productive, but they are collecting salary for it. That, okay? you, can, that you can confirm? That we, yes. There, yes, of course. Well, I, I've been there. We've done this. We've been battling ghost names for forever. Okay. Then what happens? Then you have IMF comes in and say, hey, you have 200,000 people more than you should have. So please, freeze employment. And you say IMF is not allowing you to employ. IMF is actually saving you because you have created a problem that you don't know how to get out of it. Whether it's by politicians loading various departments and agencies with people or whatever. We have created that problem. So IMF comes in and says, look, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. This is the discipline that you were asking Joe Jackson about, which we have not been able to do for whatever reason, political, whatever. And these guys are coming in, and now you are saying that you are calling them a bad, a bad guy, that they've given you policies. 
that you should have implemented in the first place. On the finance minister, <clears throat> I really think that he's now a beleaguered finance minister. Mm. And uh, his performance has been abysmal. I mean, we know him in his investment banking days, obviously, you know, done well for himself. But in the public sector space, he is basically failed. And for me, the decent thing for him to do is to resign. And the reason why he should resign is that this is someone who doesn't believe in the IMF. And I think one of your guys who called him. He sent a message about that. He had made a lot of statements. I mean, in the, in, the, in the town hall meeting in Tamale, uh, uh, in the north. Yes. For ELV. He's, he's a ELV. He said a lot of things against IMF. He called them the Washington masters who have been making our economy a disaster. And he has no plan of returning there. His deputy, my brother John Kuma, also came and I, I wouldn't blame him. Of course, you can't say something different from your substantive. Okay, so he is not to blame. So the man, the back, as uh, Harry Truman said, stops the back with stops with him. All right. And he must go. And I, and I support the President Mahama in, in asking so, for him to resign. resign. Right. But, but let me but end nothing. here. I'll end here. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you. I'll end here. I'll end here. I'll end here. I'll come back to you. Don't worry. Just let me end here. When you have a finance minister, who is your star player? Who is the, wearing the captain's armband? Who is your relative? If you have to relegate, take him out <clears throat> and bring someone else in, who are you going to bring? This is Nana Akufuadu's headache at the moment. Mm. Uh, the Member of Parliament for Cape Coast South, uh, the Anabu Kukuri Kitsagan, mm. and uh, Mr. Alfred George Thompson is looking at him in bewilderment. The, the note is done. I thought you were going to give him like two hours. No. Because it's, it's, <laughs> it's okay. Like... No, Professor Lord Mensah, that would probably good morning. People. <laughs> Professor Lord Mensah, good morning. Profile with, with us. Please don't mute your microphone. Okay, we'll get back to uh, Professor uh, Lord Mensa in a bit. Let me, let me go to Dr. Kwachi. Then I'll come to Mr. Thompson, who has a few more points to make. But let me start from you. I have a lot more points okay, to make. Okay, then go on. <laughs> uh, you, you've heard uh, Mr. Ricketts, uh, Hannibal Ricketts, again, yeah. sorry, he, on he, the points he has made on what he sees as being the IMF's role in this. And of course, he situates the government's role in the current situation that you have disagreed with, obviously, in your initial comments. I, I, I really want to focus on the way forward more. But since you have rebuttals, I'll, I'll give you time to go ahead. Yeah, you see, no one wants to go to an external body to dictate the terms of which you should run your country. It's, it's not anything enjoyable to do. And so when minister was saying that, listen, I don't believe in IMF, what he's saying is that I don't want external people to come and tell us how to run it. We are capable of doing our own things. We are capable of disciplining ourselves. We are capable of putting ourselves under check. And that is what should be done in the first place. Now, when you look at the program of the Nana Kufadu government, you realize, I mean, we were talking about balance of payment and everything. The main problem being that uh, we needed more foreign exchange and everything. So you, looked at, you look at what he put in place. It takes time. It doesn't come up in one day. You look at the Tree Crop Development Authority that he, um, he formed and inaugurated. They are supposed to look after mangoes, cashews, oil palm, shea butter, coconut, etc., etc., etc. And it's supposed to be exported and some income come in, some foreign exchange made. You look at the Ghana Aluminum Development Company, the GIADEC. Yeah. You look at the Ghana Integrated Iron and Steel Development Company. All these are supposed to bring in some, but it takes time for it to be really established. The I mean, money to set up. No, the money to set up is quite huge. And that mm -hmm. is why we had all these, um, you know, sometimes people ask about where is all the money. But it's gone into things that within the next five, six years, you'll be, you'll be raking in a lot to make um, income out of it. And that is why when he keeps on telling you that, listen, let's look at Ghana beyond aid. We are looking at the future of this country. Immediately now, what do we need to put in place whilst we are waiting for this five, six years that we know that all these things will bring in the yielded income that should come in. And that is why we needed to quickly go to IMF. It's not because uh, we can't run affairs or we can't do things here. But it's because you need to also make sure that you don't fall into a pit whilst you are waiting for the bigger cash cow to come in. And so he knows 
But you know, at the moment, because that hasn't been yielded or that hasn't been seen yet, those yields haven't come in yet. Definitely, I mean, anybody sitting back who wants to come into power will play around it and say that, listen, you people are not managing well. You people are not doing the right things that you should do. They know where their money is going. They know what um, the yields will be in the next two, three, four, five years. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it doesn't happen. As I'm saying, when you even start a, a factory, a small factory, you don't expect to get yields within two, three years. It takes time. But these are huge, huge investment um, things that we are looking at. And we're not going to sit down and just say that, oh, yes, we've thrown our arms in despair because we feel immediately. You know, I, I told you recently I went to Nigeria. Nigeria, mm -hmm. oil producing, they are forming queues mm. to buy fuel. Do you want us to get to that extent? No. We want to sit down and get there. So every necessary um, thing that should be put in place to make sure that we don't get to a situation where, because the moment you start um, forming queues to buy fuel, don't forget that all your food prices will go up. Mm -hmm. every, even your productivity will come down because people will not be able to go to work. People will not be able to do certain things that they need to do, even to run your whole I mean, country, the system. It's like you are shutting down your system. So that is one of the measures that, is, that led us to push ourselves. And they talked about the balance of, yes, the balance of payment is a great thing. You talked about the reserves. You talked about the cocoa syndication and this. I don't know why you are saying that the cocoa syndication, year on, year on, the cocoa syndication has, has been going on. And they've been using it for the necessary things that they should use it for. So, so let's, let's not nicely play politics around it. Let us look at the problem and let us solve it. The problems are being solved, but it takes time. We don't expect us, you know, when we were taking, inflation dropped when we took over from 17.5 to about 7.414%. Uh, inflation dropped. We are talking about the, uh, what do you call the uh, uh, interest reserve that increased from 3.5 months cover to about uh, 4.1 months import uh, less than cover. So you realize that things were being put in place when we took over. But... All this, and he, I'm glad he came back and said that, yes, um, you can't blame everything on Ukraine and uh, what you call it, COVID, but they're a part of it. Everything comes back to the main issue. What is the issue? External forces. And once you are growing it, you see, I told you it was from 3.5 to 4.5. You are mm -hmm. growing it. You are growing your reserves. You don't expect me that when I'm growing my reserves, I would always be going into those reserves and making sure that I'm using it just to... I'm looking at other ways and means of which I can um, make money to make sure that I put my reserves there for all these great bigger shocks that are coming. Because we don't know when this thing is going to end. So mm -hmm. do I quickly go and rely on my reserves and deplete it? Or I see how I can use other ways of you know, managing certain things whilst the reserves are there and we use it for other um, things when it comes to that um, point. These are things that it's difficult to manage, but you need to also put your mind together. And seriously speaking, I am telling you, we've been there before. We've come out of IMF. We, we took over when we were in IMF. Mm. We managed the situation and we came out of it clean. Nana said one thing. The president said one thing. He says, listen, we know how to turn an economy around, but we don't know how to bring dead bodies back to life. And I'm telling you, MPP, we are going to turn this thing around. It's not something that is going is devastating. It's not something that is going to kill us, but it's something that when we put our minds together, and I'm employing on everybody, all the Joe Jacksons, the Dr. Kwache, the Theo Achampon, and Lord Mesa and everything, they should all come on board and accept that, listen, it's happened. Will, they, will you listen when they come on board? Because that's a big it's, problem. I'm coming. A it's lot happened. of them say nobody listens. Okay, let me finish. I'm saying that it's happened. No, but you, you're making a call. It's I'm happened. Telling I'm telling you that, that they are there. When I said when, 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 when they come on board, listen, um, there's only one person who holds the steer. Mm. The, when the good side come, you blame him. Um, you praise him. When the bad side comes, you blame him. So definitely, you bring your mind. Listen, sometimes when you sit in the chair and you are here, mm. A will come and tell you this, do this. B will come and tell you do this. C will come and tell you do this. It's for you to choose which one to do. A will think you are not doing this, but C will see that you are doing this. Okay. B will see that you are not doing this, but A will see that you are doing this. So, you see, sometimes you will think, you will sit there and you say that, oh, um, I advise them and they didn't listen. But he's listened to someone else. He's looked at it and said, okay, let me go this route and see whether it will help. Or let me go this route and make sure that I put things in place and it helps all of us. What I'm saying is that whatever the decision, let us all come on board. Let us hold on and say that, listen, it is about Ghana. It is about this country. And we want to see the light because there is light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm telling you, we can see that light when we hold our hands together and say that, together we are going to do it and we can do it i know that we can do it 
We've done it before. We'll do it again. And we'll do it alone. We'll do it together with the Ghanaian people and for the Ghanaian people. All right. A call to bring all hands on deck from the former <laughs> Deputy MD of the National Investment Bank, Alfred George Thompson. Professor Lord Mensah, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, good morning. I'm sorry, I went offline. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know I was offline, actually. No, it's okay. Yeah. Um, it, it's good to have you back. We've looked at this whole decision to go to the IMF and all, and I, I, I want your thoughts first on the decision to go and what you expect from the IMF and Ghana's engagement. And then we will deal with the record of the IMF and its programs, because there seems to be something there. I'm looking at 763 programs just within a certain time frame 512 interrupted 209 291 did not resume so the success rate for completion is very 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 low when it comes to the imf and there are reasons for that so let's start first of all from your thoughts on this decision to engage with the imf first of all well um if you look at the dynamics um over the years and how aggressive uh, we've been spending, and that spending um, not yielding from the short to medium term as expected. I foresaw um, this country going to IMF. However, the economic managers who are sitting by the economy, who knows the numbers, who actually can detect which direction the economy should go, depending on the information available to them, was telling, were telling us that, yes, indeed, uh, we are in a good footing. And so, therefore, if we manage our own finances, if we stay financially disciplined, and then more so introduce, you know, levies here and there, i.e. looking at internally, how to solve our financial problem, uh, we should be fine. But then I've realized that um, history has never been on our, on our side when uh, the country declares that we want to stay financially disciplined ourselves. We normally become successful when we have an external you know, supervisor. Let me put it that way, a headmaster on the block looking on us to do the right thing. Government gives us, gave us a signal, which obviously, when you go to IMF, part of it will be some of the conditions that will be given to you. Government indicated to us that they're going to cut expenditure. They're going to reduce some expenditure lines to ensure that we stay within where we can you know, be economically comfortable. Government introduced you know, a homegrown policy like the e-levy to ensure that it, they enhanced our revenue generation, you know, streams. But then um, let me look at the budget that was read for 2022, which in it, uh, the numbers, you can get a signal that will definitely go to higher. This is a budget that was read and we're looking at a deficit of about 37 billion. Now, with this deficit, government knowing very well, at that time, we had not been downgraded. But the government says that there's pressure on us when we go to the, there will be pressure on us when we go to the euro bond market. So, for the first time, because usually, if you look at the history, financing of our deficit has been more or less almost 50-50, a balance. We usually do 50%, almost 50% from Ghana, uh, from, you know, internal, and then 50%, you know, external. But for the first time, with out of the 37 billion, we're doing, we plan to do 27.9 billion financing domestically, and then 4.5 billion, you know, external. So government foresaw that pressure. And out of the 27 billion that we were looking at from the domestic front, uh, let's assume that the 7 billion uh, will be will be something that would have been realized through the yield of if we were to go by the e However, uh, we, the 20 billion that is going to be financed, the question is where are we going to get that from? We're looking at the, um, the treasury bill market. And obviously, at the time, government was struggling because government issue bills and then the target will not be met. 
because at that time interest rates were hovering close to the inflation and that the bill rate and so effectively um, government had to up the game and ensure that you know the rate goes above you know the um, inflation rate and it has implication on the economy because what was going to happen is that cost of borrowing will start turning i mean going up because everybody will be comfortable lending to i mean investing in government treasuries but government gives that assurance that sovereign guarantee to ensure that whatever it owes its people definitely should be able to you know uh, pay back so all the signals were there and clearly government knows very well that the 20 billion we had to borrow all through to you know on the market through treasury bills there's going to be a serious squeeze you know in the economy towards the private sector and we've been drumming that there's no liquidity when it comes to private man's accessibility to funds and at the same time we had introduced e levy and the e levy is tied to economic performance we need to ask ourselves when does people do transfer transfers of funds on the momo platform has to do with liquidity businesses are doing transfers individuals will be doing transfers only when there's funds available so when the economies are not doing well you will definitely not realize the target that you set for e levy and as a result of that obviously the, the the main alternative will be that we go to the imf but you see if you look at our history i think uh, the earlier presenter or the second presenter was giving us the frequency of our visit as a country to the imf and then you know um the possible uh, benefits that we gain and you will come to realize that you know uh, we run in the country as if uh, someone who has I seem to have lost sound for Professor Lord Mens, and we will try uh, and work on that quickly. But just take a couple more messages while we try and rectify that while looking at um, Ghana's decision to go uh, to the IMF. Okay, Luke, seem to have Professor Lord Mensa back. Oh. Prof, please Hello, continue. We lost you for please. a bit. Yes, yes, yes. So um, what I was driving to is that if you look at our frequency of visit to the IMF over the years, uh, clearly it tells you that it's like almost every four years we visit the IMF. And this, for me, um, runs to me as um, a country that has taken up insurance and then run ourselves into a ditch or run ourselves into a crash. And then we, we want the IMF to come and rescue us. I mean, during the COVID, clearly on the grounds, uh, we saw that you know the economy will not behave as an economy that we know. During the COVID, everybody knows that globally things were not going well. But what was our posture when it comes to our expenditure? It was within this COVID that we had what we call the Fiscal Responsibility Act. But then the finance minister in his budget review asked permission to go to yeah. parliament to go and review, I mean, this fiscal responsibility act so that they can have that space of borrow. We had not hesitated IMF by that time. And clearly, this tells you that when we were with IMF, we were doing very well. We were gearing towards the target IMF, you know, gave us. Budget deficit of about 5% which is going to tame down, you know, our borrowing and all those. But immediately, we, 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 we jump into COVID, which under normal circumstance, we were supposed to adapt that conserved, you know, um, um, management skills. We were rather aggressive. We were rather spending as if there's a big future out there for this economy. And as a result of that, when you spend, we should be able to rake in during you know, the bigger economic outlook that we expected. But that wasn't the case. We were spending our way through, but then in the end, the benefit that the economy, the economy is supposed to reap, right, is not being realized. When, you know, you look at this, it tells you that, look, indeed, this country knew 
were supposed to go to IMF. Year levy has been introduced. If we go to IMF right now, IMF will definitely come in hitting on our balance sheet. So obviously, we look at the expenditure. Now, the expenditure, are we prepared politically to sacrifice some of the social spendings that we've been doing? Typical example is free SHS. But, but, but hold on now, there. Recently, the, 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 the last... recently, there has been, recently, there has been agitation at the labor front asking for cola. Mm. When we go to IMF, are we prepared, you know, to sacrifice that aspect? And I presume that at that point, IMF will be in control. So whatever labor front will be asking for, the reference will be that in the midst of IMF, we cannot, you know, give out this cola. So there's pressure on the economy. And that is why I believe that government had to seek refuge, you know, um, 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 to with IMF. And so... I'm not surprised we are going to IMF. I see it clearly. But we should be ready, you know, to sacrifice. But, you know, uh, in as much as we go, of course, every, you know, sacrifice that we do, uh, we must expect a benefit. And I can say that while going to IMF, um, obviously, will give us that kind of soft benefit, which is the fiscal discipline that we're going to enjoy. And then also the credibility that we're going to have um, as a result of, having IMF in our midst. Now, this credibility, I'm praying that this credibility that we're going to enjoy will, will not push our economic management to continue to borrow as um, we're doing earlier. But rather, the credibility should help us to renegotiate some of our debt that is putting pressure mm -hmm. on our balance sheet. So effectively, um, this is what we're supposed to expect and the reason and then the antecedent of this country going to IMF is what um, I've indicated to you. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Lord Mesa, for those thoughts. We'll take another break. When we come back, I'll take uh, just a quick solution round from Dr. Tia Champo and Dr. Kwachi, and then we'll wrap this uh, segment up and deal with Arise Ghana and matches arising. I see the, uh, George Lowe already checking out his documents. We'll be right back. Tell them I'm not in, eh? Tell them. When you evade taxes, you put yourself at risk of prosecution. Do the right thing. Pay your duties and taxes online, through the bank, or from your phone on time. And let's build a great nation. The sisters are back with more chic and spice than ever. Beginning this July, join the League of Exceptional Sisters as they come to the rescue of relationships with the all-new season of Sister, Sister. Be it gut-wrenching personal secrets, jaw-dropping partner shenanigans, or the cringe-worthy deeds of family and friends, our sisters will be here to help you weave through the simplest and most complicated relationship issues. Catch the all-new season of Sister, Sister every Every Thursday at 7 p.m. on 97.3 City FM and Friday at 9 p.m. on City TV. Sister Sister is sponsored by Kel Kids Toothpaste and the Ghana AIDS Commission. Welcome back to the big issue on City TV and also on City 97.3 FM. Let me do a quick solutions round. And uh, Dr. Champo, I'll give you three solutions and then I'll give Dr. Kwasi three solutions as well. So four solutions for the government of Ghana going forward. What would you say? Three. Top. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're forcing me to the world. There's a lot to discuss. I would love to... Uh... You know, a few quick rebuttals on some of the issues that have been... Okay, I'll give you... I'll give you... 
I'll give you time on the rebuttal. I'll go ahead. Oh, okay. No, 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 not fine. Actually, just further comments. But I, okay. I think um, Honorable Ricketts makes a very, very important point, you know, uh, around the, the, the structural issues, but fundamentally that countries approach the IMF first and foremost to deal with a balance of payments problem or, uh, or challenges. And those of us who have been following this economy over the past, you know, several years knew as of December, December um, last year, January this year, that we were possibly heading this, this direction in that sense. Be that as it's me, this is where we are. So going to the fund gives us two things. He talked about the first one on the immediate sort of balance of payment support where we possibly, if we went under an um, extended credit facility or extended fund arrangement, the EFF, we could possibly get maybe between two and three billion um, on, on the table. Yeah. Um, but also in return for that, you have to take some reforms, uh, which are mostly structural um, in, in nature. Um, and listening to the uh, other chap in the studio talk about external forces and five years to see the returns um, and that, okay, you know, people offer advice and it looks as though, you know, people don't listen. For me, it just calls into question, really, the whole principle or ethos of policy making in the current dispensation. I don't personally think that we are rigorous enough with the data, with the evidence base, and we're not, uh, or from the government point of view, seeking enough alternative views on the right course of action. So what must we do quickly? I think the first thing really is that the president has to demonstrate some sort of uh, corrective action. One, I would love to see some ministers, you know, uh, taking the ax for this uh, um, in, in the sense that the finance minister has already indicated that in a sense, philosophically, he's against going to the fund. And I, I think it's also been uh, in power perhaps for a bit too long. So I, I would think that perhaps the time has come for the, the finance minister maybe to take to take a bow. Um, and going forward also, the government or the president to actually do a major reshuffle. We haven't seen one in a long time. And most of his appointees, in my view, are not delivering. And we need to see some sort of fire being rekindled um, in that regard. Number two, uh, and, and this we've been talking about, the wasteful spending and cutting back on that. Government said they were going to cut 20 to 30% of the 2022 um, uh, budget in terms of expenditure. Where are we on that? Which other line items can we do uh, in that regard? And then third point uh, on the revenue generation uh, aspects. My views on the E-Levy are very well known. I don't support it uh, as a matter of principle. Uh, and I don't think that is the way to go um, with the circumstances or the challenges we find ourselves in. I, there's a commitment or by the government to getting the tax exemptions bill being passed. And I think if anything, what this should tell us is to fast track that process and quickly pass that exemptions bill so that we can actually be able to plug some of the loopholes and you know bring in uh, much more uh, revenues um, in, in, in that in that in that regard. But the, maybe the last or the fourth point really is the broader national conversation where the, the partisanship is just too much. And that really is what is clouding what otherwise should be rational, evidence-based, objective-led decision-making. All right. Thank you very much, Theo. Dr. Kwache, your first solutions. Three. Well, first, I want government to give us the reasons why they are taking us to the IMF. You know, it's not stated in the, in the notice. I'm sure that if you polled Ghanaians as to whether we should go to the IMF or not, an overwhelming majority will say we shouldn't be going, I'm sure. So government should tell us why they are a minority and why they are taking us to the IMF. Very quickly, they should come up with that. Then, of course, looking at the future program, because now we have decided we are going, um, they should also involve the public, civil society organizations, you know, in putting the program together um, before they take it to the, the, the IMF. Because it, it shouldn't be just a government program. The rest of us should know and contribute, you know, to the program that they are taking to the IMF. Uh, 
you know, we can make contributions in terms of uh, you know, revenue generation. You know, uh, my friend has mentioned some of them, the exemptions, property taxes, trade taxes, and, and so on, which we need to, you know, increase. And then the expenditure side also, the compensation, um, you know, which is consuming all our revenue, our taxes. Um, public sector, how much, I mean, the size of the public sector, the reform that can be undertaken there. The issue Article 71, you, you know, appointees, and then the emoluments, and then, and, the, and then the lack of transparency there and all that. Um, then we should go into reforms in you know, public financial management itself, <laughs> how to improve budgetary reform, uh, you know, uh, uh, reforms and so on. Um, and then also, we need to institute an, a body that will oversee the budget, budget formulation, budget implementation, and so on. Parliament is weak in doing that. So there's a need for another body, you know, to be attached to Parliament, Parliamentary Budget Office of, of some sort, you know, to assist Parliament in overseeing the budget. We will say that there are some key policy initiatives that government going to the IMF should and says that at least they are, you know, protected. The free senior high school, free, you know, nursing training allowances, free, you know, teacher training allowances. They are, you know, initiatives that are helping to build our human capital. You see, so we should try and protect them, but they could be reformed. So to make them more efficient. And then other social protections that we, I, I'm sure even the IMF itself will say that uh, maybe you should we should protect some of these measures that uh, go to the, uh, the, the you know, help of, uh, of uh, the, the, the disadvantage in the society. And then finally, I will say that we should also pay attention to our natural resource wealth. And, uh, you know, because there's a lot of revenue there, you know, that we can mobilize to transform this economy, you know, and, and, and get ourselves out of this financial kind of uh, bind. Um, and in the past, you know, we have ceded the resources away. We've ceded it to foreign investors, and we get very little out of it. That is an area that we need to go in there and see how we can magnify, you know, maximize our benefits. I mean, Ghana um, and mobilize those resources to transform this economy. All right. Thank you very much, Doctor uh, J.K. Kwachi, senior economist of the Institute of Economic Affairs. Let me hear from uh, Honorable Horike Sagan. Solutions, yeah. forward solutions. I, I know you, you, you've, you've discussed the problem yeah. in a few, but three forward solutions, if you have any. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, I agree with um, some of the solutions that uh, our doctors and professors have come up with. But as I said earlier, for us to be able to resolve the problems that we have, we need to be able to segregate the problems. Okay, in the long term, all the problems that we face are connected and they all require long term solution, which is a structured solution. Mm -hmm. But somebody will say we have to live today to be able to see tomorrow. We have a short term problems being caused some by our own doing mismanagement, others by the exogenous factors that we've talked about. So we need to break it down. First of all, when you come to the as i said earlier on your debt and your deficit okay and when you look at say they are talking about the 30 percent and i think doc said yeah. we need to know where that is that is significant in a sense that if you cut you are able to cut your expenditure by by 30 percent you actually reduce your deficit by 75 percent simple mathematics if you have 100 billion as your expenditure and 60 billion as your expenditure in nominal terms your deficit is 40 billion if you cut your 100 billion by 30 percent you get 70 billion if your revenue doesn't change if you are not able to do anything to your revenue of 60 billion your deficit will reduce to 10 billion that's 75 percent so if they are religious with that they should be able to reduce the deficit. And as I said, the deficit is accumulation of debt. So debt will also begin to come down. Now, the second section of the solution is to do with the high inflation, the fuel, and all that. Now, if 
they should not ask Bank of Ghana or allow Bank of Ghana to use monetary policy to address what is a fiscal problem. Mm. Because the high inflation or the situation we have, the inflation we have at the moment, is not demand driven. It's supply. It's We've been talking about supply and cost. Now, if you look at the petroleum situation, it's as a result of the world prices going up. In the past, we had subsidies, which is the regulated market, which government obviously was taking that cost. We removed that subsidy. Government is not static. When you get to a situation where you are claiming that Ukraine and uh, what is it called, COVID, are the problem, then it's not a normal time. So you can reinstate some of these subsidies. And where is that money going to come from? Government, because the, the, the petroleum finished product coming into the country is at no cost or very little cost to government because they are no longer subsidies. Mm -hmm. They pass on the price straight to the consumer. What the government does with central bank is to arrange, at the moment, arrange hard currency again for them to be able to, or ring fence hard currency for them to be able to bring this in. Now, don't forget that a tax, when you look at the price build up, as mathematicians will tell you, the tax is always a coefficient of parameters. And the, all the parameters are based on crude because it is as a result of the crude prices going up. That is why the price at the pump is also going up. So you realize that if the crude, if we, we put in the budget, 65 or 63 dollars let's say 65 dollars for crude that's the forecast and crude goes to 100 then you are gaining some 35 that you did not anticipate for that 35 also will affect your coefficient so your tax revenue that you'll be, you, you'll be getting in will also go up so government is getting an excess tax which nobody talks about it's been silent that, that money that is coming in can be used as a temporal subsidy. You know, when we put up taxes, we talk about sunset clauses and all that. That means that taxes are not really supposed to be permanent. When they serve their purpose, you can remove them. So front end, there's money there. Then you come to the back, back end. Ghana is among the oil producing nations, no matter how small we produce. The balance sheet for the petroleum product coming in is different from the balance sheet for the crude oil that we are producing. They are not the same because we don't produce crude and refine to use. Mm -hmm. So when you hear people saying that we are a net exporter or net importer, it doesn't really matter whether you are a net exporter or net importer because the balance sheet we are looking at are two different balance sheets. So when you come to the back end, the crude that was again estimated or the forecast was $65, which has now gone to 100 or let's peg it at 100 It's creating another 35 in terms of revenues coming in as a result of selling our crude. That is what is estimated to be about 450 to 500 million US dollars. That can also be used temporarily as a, and have a sunset clause to use to cushion the oil, you know, the, the mm. price at the pump. If you don't end it there. If you don't do that, you've given them two. Yeah. If you don't do that, you are going to escalate the situation on the inflation side. Because now the fuel price does not only stand or two on its own as inflation, but it feeds also into food inflation as a result of bringing the food from yeah. the farm gate and all that. So you are going to leave Bank of Ghana with no choice. Bank of Ghana is targeting inflation. So what Bank of Ghana is going to be doing is that, hey, inflation is getting out of hand. Let's do something. What they are going to do is the 250 and the 200 basis point, which is quite astronomical. Because on the other side, it is increasing lending rate. Mm -hmm. a yeah. bank, it's increasing the lending rate. So in the end, you are going to slow down the economy mm -hmm. and possibly get a recession. So these guys need to be smart about this. All right. We've been there. We've seen it. We've suffered it. And if you, you listen uh, to and you are advice, sharing your insights. Yeah, I'm sharing my insights. It's a free.
<laughs> free consultancy. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. If Remember they call me for Sechi, Sechi I'm supposed to help us. <laughs> Cape Coast address, South. Address I'll take another you. break. The biggest should be right back. Welcome back to the big issue on City TV and in the second phase of the program. Of course, we're staying with um, social activism, activism, I must say, because this week, uh, Ghanaians took to the streets to protest what they say is the uh, high cost of living and general economic hardship. Uh, but it was not without drama. It was a two-day uh, protest, uh, first day, uh, saw clashes between the police and some section of uh, the protesters and uh, the second day I must say was largely very smooth um, their voices were heard uh, and we we saw a mixture of uh, politicians and uh, everyday citizens of uh, the Republic of Ghana march hand in hand uh, to Parliament to present a petition on what they felt was uh, wrong with uh, the economy and the things that needed to be done so like I said it was a two-day uh, March Monday and then Tuesday but on the Monday, uh, 12 police officers, uh, the reports of 12 police officers uh, being injured and also dozens of protesters uh, being injured, 29 demonstrators were arrested for the uh, alleged attacks on the police. And according to the reports yesterday, they will be put before court uh, on Monday. And I have their lawyer here uh, who has joined us, uh, George Lowe, former member of parliament as well, uh, everyday politician with us as well as Martin Pebu, who's a private legal practitioner. And then his Abwaji Miracles will also uh, join us via Zoom. But let me start the conversation from uh, Mr. Lo and the 29. Do you represent all 29? Well, uh, it depends on how the police choose to do the prosecution. Because, you know, some they were spread over various police stations. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, obviously, we do not know whether they would lump all of them together mm. and do one prosecution. Um, by if that happens, then of course the legal team uh, mm. would would do the representation for all. Mm. If they are spread in various circuit mm. courts, uh, then we would have to divide ourselves. Uh, but but do you have a clear idea of what they are being charged with so far? Oh, uh, you know, I mean, the, during the interaction, it's a very funny, funny. Uh, things are coming up. But typical of the police, you cannot second guess them until they bring yes. you uh, yes. the, the, the yes. charge. So I, I don't want to even second guess them. Yes. I mean, we've seen charges yes. in this country mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> which has nothing, anything close mm. yeah. to the alleged uh, crime for which they were told mm. when they were arrested on the spot. So I, I think that uh, we are ready for anything. But outside of representing them, I'm sure you are also a member of the Arise Ghana movement. What was the objective of what you sought to do Monday, Tuesday? Well, uh, I, I think, uh, let me say good morning to our cherished listeners. And viewers. And, uh, let me just put it on record that uh, our, the motive for which the demonstration was organized uh, had not been lost on Canadians. We had put it out mm -hmm. that you were protesting mm -hmm. generally about uh, harsh standards of living mm -hmm. and many other things that we thought was not in the interest of Ghani uh, mm -hmm. the Ghanaian pub pub public. So basically... Uh, we just wanted the government to realize that Ghanaians were not happy with how they are running this country. And uh, therefore, uh, things were getting out of hand. Could you high uh, <coughs> fuel prices, for instance, it has eaten the income of Ghanaians so much so that uh, if you were one who spent, say, five cities on breakfast every day, you will likely to be spending about uh, between 15 and 20 cities. And that, that is monumental hype mm. in, in that. I know a lady who said she went to her favorite uh, watchy joint. Mm. And then, you know, you go, give me watches, uh, mommy meets back home, give me. So mm. in her mind, she knows that oh, normally I take 10 cities. Mm -hmm. When they finish, they take 25 cities. She almost passed out mm. <laughs> because she had him plan for that. Yeah. But you see, this hardship we are talking about, it's a Ghanaian thing. So it wasn't even from any political perspective. Mm. I'll tell you one funny story. In the melee, the confusion, I saw a policeman run mm -hmm. past. So I said, ah, what are you doing? You people, uh, do you know, he said, <laughs> that is a policeman mm -hmm. who was supposed to be, mm -hmm. you know, 
protect, I mean, uh, 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 providing security for the demonstrators. He himself is admitting that, Charlie, things are hard. And if you spoke to the policemen one-on-one, -on -one, they all were happy with what we were doing. Okay. Because they think that a lot of these things has fallen off. On government's deaf ears, mm -hmm. because people have made the point. At least, the taxes on petroleum. Mm -hmm. It's like 4.5 CDs on a, uh, 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 a liter. People are saying, at least if you take one or two off, give us the semblance mm -hmm. of you are doing something. Yeah. The challenge was that it, it, it appeared government didn't care. Yeah. Because if, if we are saying that we are falling on hard times, if the average Ghanaian says that, look, our salary... A disposable income cannot take us home. You know, where if you have a seven year old boy like I have who comes to school, comes from school and tells you that daddy, Charlie, the five cities you are giving me now, it can't do anything. We have got into that stage and we are still would have expected that look. The government, the, they, they used to do with the COVID thing. Mm -hmm. Come and talk to Ghanaians at least. Mm -hmm. Tell them that look, we know your challenges. Mm -hmm. We are disposed to finding the best solution possible. Yeah. We are looking at all the alternatives. Bear with us. In the meantime, we are doing A, B, C, D. If the president came and said that, look, in the meantime, unless the, my travel is very, very, very important, mm -hmm. I'm going to reduce mm -hmm. even the travel. Even the mode of traveling, I'm going to sacrifice. Now... Has, hasn't he been sacrificing? Oh, sacrificing the air, bathing and all that. We are, we are still going to do that. <laughs> you know... I mean, something as simple as, henceforth, my convoy will not be more than three cars, four cars. Mm -hmm. For yeah. a president? Yes. I mean, why? Because mm -hmm. you've been to Rwanda, mm -hmm. haven't you? Mm -hmm. eh? mm -hmm. Have you seen Paul Kigami come to the office? Yes. Sometimes if you are not told, you don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you see, things are happening elsewhere. People yeah. are doing things. You see, you, you, it's leadership. Mm -hmm. You provide a certain direction where the people feel that Come what me. Even the leader is making sacrifices. But where you, it, it begins to look like they, they continue to live large. They don't care. Even the things they say does not give anybody cold comfort. Mm. So how can a, a whole finance minister or a whole bank of Ghana uh, 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 governor comes and tell you, the citizen, that Charlie, this inflation, you don't even know where it's coming from. You don't understand it anymore. Then, I mean, you have thrown your house mm -hmm. in the air. Mm -hmm. But, but in, in doing all of these things, I'm sure you also heard like, the protest mandate issues, and I'll get a couple of things. Yes. There are legal issues I raised with yes. uh, Martin. But the fact, I heard the information minister say that there are those who are trying to, there's an accusation of fomenting instability with some of these protests. You heard that remark? I heard that remark, and I found it very disingenuous on the part of the information minister, because these are the things that even fuel mm -hmm. and instigate the, the, the public. Because there's a, a third force or an outsider come to tell you, uh, your wife, that Charlie, 2000 to the market is not buying nothing. Why? When I go and buy petrol, is it a third force that tells me that mm -hmm. now I'm buying petrol for like 11 cities per liter? I mean, so these are childish things that we shouldn't be talking about. I'm saying that there's a real problem. Now he's saying that until uh, 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 recently he realized that the, 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 the chop money he gives in the house and nothing. The, the same minister said that. So clearly he too, that mentality that he has, was it fueled by some external force? The reality is that the Ghanaians are suffering, we are hungry. Could you? Everything is gone up. But, but in the eyes, so, they are so, saying you could have, there, there were ways to do it, but it looks like there, there, there is. A a calculation. Okay, so when, Akuf, when Nana Akufuado disagreed with VAT mm -hmm. when he was an opposition leader, the demonstration that led to the death of Ahuma Hanga was the only means he had. He could have written a letter to the president. He could have held a press conference. Mm -hmm. So, please, I mean, these things, we shouldn't be going there. We are, Ghanaians are matured now. So when we want to say things, this demonstration, because you wanted to drum, drum it mm. home very well. That is why it became novel that we mm. did it for two days running. It has mm. never happened before. Mm. So we are telling you that we are not dealing with normal times. But the first day, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. What happened? You see, the first day. You were told where to start. You, you see, the to first day. You see, remember that we had agreed 
with a root with the police. Mm -hmm. Then they chose at the last minute to go to court. Mm -hmm. Fine. So when they went to court, the court gave certain. We also disagreed. So we quickly found, in fact, we prepared before mm -hmm. going to the court mm -hmm. that if the court doesn't give us what we want, we'll stay the decision mm -hmm. and appeal against it. Mm -hmm. Which we did, and it's very legal. The learned friend is here. Very, very legal. We hadn't done anything on tour. So when the, and remember, the court never said that don't go on the possession, don't do mm -hmm. the two days. They only mm -hmm. varied the routes that we wanted yeah. to take, which we disagreed with. So mm -hmm. we appealed against it. Mm -hmm. Then when we got on the, on the ground, the police were aware that we had found a thing. But they insisted that we still would not, they would not allow us to use the route that we wanted to use, which we had earlier agreed on. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point, our leadership said, you know what, you guys, let's stay at Obras Port. If they will not let us go, let's stay there. Mm -hmm. So there was a situation where we were in Obras Port, and then our leadership would come and address us, mm -hmm. one address after the other. People even tried to push on the route. The leadership calmed them down and said, wait, you wait. If they will not allow us to stay here. Then, some way, somehow, stones fly from a certain direction, mm -hmm. which we came to understand was being thrown by somebody we identified as a policeman. Mm. Mm. Yes. And That's your version. No, of I'm telling you. And we actually grabbed the guy and handed him over to the police. Mm. Mm. Yes. So when it happened, the police moved in. Then the tear gas started. Now there was no response from the, some of the protesters before. No, the no, I'm saying that came. I'm saying that there was stones started flying. At that time we didn't even know that the persons were throwing the at least the one person we caught who started throwing the stones and mm. from that direction was ah. Ah, well, and you see it to the front pages. And you see, the interesting thing is that they were dressed like a rice. Ah. They were not in the police outfit. Okay. This person was wearing a red top. So how did you know he was a policeman? Yes, because some he was identified. Ah. Okay. So we came but he could not be a policeman who we was came protesting. To learn, we came no, we came to learn later that it was part of the operations strategy of the police to infiltrate the ranks. Oh. And so some people came, some police officers came dressed like the demonstrators to be able to... And, I'm, and, and, and you know why I know that? And I believe that. Mm. Apparently, what they did, which possibly could be a, a normal police or that, they were taking photographs of protesters. Mm. And so some of the protesters who were arrested later were, were, were arrested because... They were filming, videoing the thing. And so they looked at the video and identified some people and picked them up. So, so basically, that was what happened. Now, the sad and the interesting thing is that when we had gotten these policemen and handed them over to the police, later on, where you were supposed to have gone, because we were waiting for the police leadership to come and hand you over, they prevented us from entering the place. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you've reviewed most of the video. There was a place mm -hmm. when Prince yes, yes. Derek De Ajay, myself, uh, 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 Akamba, and, and they were struggling to enter mm -hmm. a certain room because that was where the guy mm -hmm. was. When we event when Akamba and Prince them eventually got there, the guy had vanished. Mm -hmm. Somebody who we have handed over to the police had vanished. Well, what, 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 this, what was the situation with Joshua Akamba? Because we saw a tweet from the police, yes. that protester Joshua Kamba had uh, been seen with a sidearm. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a one is the registered oh, sidearm. No, no, that one, I'm yeah. saying Not that. A demonstration. No, no, listen, listen. You see, everybody has a duty, depending on what levels of society in which you are, to protect yourself. To the extent that he didn't use them, gun. to the extent that he didn't take it out. So, For I'm me, on the first day of the demonstration. Yeah. And I will ask for that you one. See, that one. You see, you go, uh, uh, Kojo, Kojo, let me tell you something. I was having a discussion with some friends of mine last week. And I told them that it's likely that 90% of leadership of all the people, all, all the political parties in this country may have to arm themselves when we are going to the next election at the police station. Sorry. Because if what? the police... <laughs> well, if the soldiers, don't like I'm guns. saying the soldiers... Who, don't if like a soldier can look your son in the face 
and shoot him like they did to the eight uh, 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 people. You think that we should put our, our, our lives just at the hands of somebody who possibly okay. does not qualify to be anything? So in your estimation, uh, as somebody was on the ground, you are blaming the police for yes, let the me, first day going out Yes, let me finish. Yes, I let finish. And you know what happened? So when the police fired the tear gas, it got, brought the confusion. For me, there was one good thing that happened. Luckily, I think some of the police people who fired the tear gas did not aim properly. It landed in the midst of the police officers at a point. And that was where the, even the confusion escalated because ah. they had to run. Oh, then let's play those videos at that You time. see, mm -hmm. ask, ask uh, uh, Roland uh, Walker. Mm -hmm. Talk to Roland. Because TV3. TV3, because I, 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 I even gave him an interview in the midst of the confusion. Police people were crying, tears were coming from there, <laughs> running helter skelter. They had climbed the top of the uh, 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 bridge. Okay. So, so clearly, you see, so those were the things that happened. Then another group of young people said, like, like they won't, they won't agree. So they got out of hand. They got out of hand, then they pushed the policeman. And then that was when the tie burning, the Started. burning of the right, Hold on for me. Let me deal with Martin on something. So, Martin, mm -hmm. what, what, what exactly is the problem? We have the situation where every time there's a protest, the police go to court mm -hmm. these days. It seems yeah. to be the norm. Yeah. Can you yeah. explain the, the legal position on that? Because there seems to be confusion because he spoke about they had an agreed route. The mm -hmm. police went to court. The court changed their route, mm -hmm. but they were like, this is the route we had chosen. Mm -hmm. On the second day, that disagreement seemed to start, but they initially they were able to you know, mm -hmm. deal with that. Mm -hmm. Is that how protests are supposed to be handled wow. by the law? Hmm. Very complex, but let's see the parts we can unpick. One, under the Public Order Act, okay, Act 491, what the law says is that when you want to demonstrate as a special event, okay, give the police five days' notice. And in the notice, you state the date you want to embark on the demonstration, the hour, mm -hmm. the route, and etc. So that they have that notification because, you know, there might likely be security implications. They need to come and protect you and the rest. Okay. So that's what the law says. Give five days notice and indicate in the notice the route, the uh, this, uh, date and all that. Good. So if the police say that they don't have men, then they will ask you to postpone. Okay. Yeah. You mm -hmm. postpone and then they route. If it's not good, they will ask that it be relocated so that you choose another uh, listen, route or route, whichever one we are using. <laughs> <laughs> okay, route, uh, Ghanaian English. Uh, yes, okay. Yes, so th these are the two things. If you look at Act 491, it says postpone or relocate. Okay. Postpone or relocate. But beyond that, you know, the law cannot cover everything. So sometimes you negotiate and get middle grounds and all that. Right. Yes. As for police always saying we don't have enough men, it's an open secret that often they are on the side of the uh, government in power. So anything they will do to frustrate you, they do. It's an open secret. Look, we, we have gone past those days where we say let's uh, be diplomatic. We have to confront the truth. This country, if we don't, we will not make much progress. And honorable, when you are in office, that's the same thing they were doing for you. Mm -hmm. The police are most often on the side of the people in government. Today, you see you on the other side, you are feeling but, 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 it. But the, yes, record, shows, yes, but the record shows that at our okay. time, people demonstrated freely oh, it without, wasn't free. without all these no, 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 things. Occupy occupy Ghana. No, no, they used uh, to happen. Let's go. So many things. They used to happen. Ah, but if you occupied Ghana, your people came there, you wanted to... Uh, this no, last year. Yes. No, no, yes. No, 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 it was That is another... Justice Ajakuma, he died subsequently when Kufuado came in. Justice Ajakuma, his eye, then subsequently died. But I'm saying that, I'm saying that the skills are not the same. The point, I think his position is too go And try something else. Because we give you power and become too arrogant. You are all the same. We'll throw you out because very soon... <laughs> we, ah, because look, look, you, I sat in class with you. What often now makes you too special that I should give my life to you to rule me throughout? Why? Oh, but you also have the and, right to go. And why? <laughs> to I also have the right to go. No, let's say. So what's the point? I'm getting tired of both of you. <coughs> but let's deal, let's deal with but the, the matter of the law, though, ah. on this. Yes. <laughs> You are providing public education. Go on, man. Yes. Uh -huh. So, five days. So, now let's come to the... So, we often know that police, look, they do it to favor 
governments in power. Yeah. That's it. It's always where police are often an appendage of the government. Look, just yesterday I was on Joy FM where I showed a corruption story. This Northern Development Authority case, okay, where the current chief executive and his deputies doubled the contract from uh, 5.7 to 10.4. The point I'm making is that when uh, somebody tried to give it to police to go and uh, to lodge a complaint investigate. The policeman fled from the case. He said, ah, the government will transfer me because the people involved are close to ministers and the rest. So you see how police act. Somebody brings you corruption and uh, public procurement case. Then you flee. The man, uh, look, the man wrote to, uh, what do you call it, Jubilee House, chief of staff, the president, vice president, five months, Dr. Anam Zoya. Mm -hmm. They yeah. never did anything. Mm -hmm. It was just God that Somehow, I don't know how this, these things work. Somebody showed me the contract. And then three weeks ago, I blew it up on news file. And now, special prosecutor is taking it. The point I'm making is that police will always be on the side of governments when okay. it comes, when the stakes are very high. Okay? okay. So, course, Arab, we are praying that if tomorrow you come back, you, you change. change. Yeah, no, we, yeah, okay. And I'm saying that the records are show different. I mean, there were a time when people wanted to demonstrate police were trying to frustrate them. Mm -hmm. Professor Mills said, yes, allow them to. It was carried on. Oh, yes. the current attorney general, BBC, I remember that time yes. when Mills was in office, the yeah, police said, tried it. Uh -huh. yeah. So you were saying so, your ties so, were demonstrating freely. Yeah, no, yeah. it was Mills who stepped in. I'm saying the that. The attorney general said no. And then when Mills stepped in and said you should demonstrate, Attorney General Godfrey Dami came on BBC and said, Who out there the president who asked him to step in? After the sitting president at a mills, honest man came in and said they should allow you to demonstrate. He turned right and said, Why is the president this interfering in the police work? <laughs> so that is it. So Godfrey tells you it's about political economy when it comes to demonstration. It's a serious political economy matter. All right. But, but I want to understand why these matters most often are not end up in court. And the citizens' right to protest, what the law says. Because there are those who believe that if they want to march or protest anything, they should be able to. Yes. Without the uh, state okay, so necessarily that's... having an input in how they do it and where it is done. I want to protest. Allow me to protest. It is my right to protest. No. Is that a right that exists? Yes, it does. Godfrey, let's say this now. You see, often because of security, listen, people, you know, because a lot of our uh, people... You know, Ghanaians are very peace living, so they don't like confrontations. Okay, we are not that confrontational. So sometimes when it comes to this law, people don't like you saying it raw. There was a case of MPP yeah, versus, versus IGP, IGP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. where they challenged this matter that police don't give you permission to go and demonstrate. It's not a right that belongs to the police or it's not in their discretion to say you can demonstrate, you cannot. No. Under the Constitution, Freedom of Movement, Article 21, and the rest, okay? You can do your demonstration. It's not subject to police it's permission. Not, no, no, no. It's okay. notification. Yes. Let's make that clear. It's not police giving you a permit. No. Supreme Court settled it in MPP versus, versus IGP. IGP. I think 1993-94. Yeah. Yes, it's something that they teach every lawyer. Constitutional law. Notification. Yes, it's, it's notification. And even if you have to open act. Uh, 491, you see that do notified. A, a, it's notified. Yes, yeah. notify the uh, police five days. They didn't say go and seek a permit, okay? So when you do that, but they also say that, you know, in our, uh, our rights from Article 12 onwards, they'll tell you that the rights are also subject to certain responsibilities and the rights of others. So let's say if you live here, so your, your street, is that uh, no you are Fanufa, right? Yeah, no uh -huh. no Good. Martin. So, uh, Martin, yours is Martin. Martin. Uh -huh. So, take it practically. You see, your cars are packed here. At least, if somebody wants to come and use this route for demonstration, you give police five days' notice. Then they intend to can notify you, even though a lot of the time they don't. But at least, some, the newspapers carry it. So, mm -hmm. somehow, indirectly, we get education. So, that security wise, if Godfrey, from what you've heard, the kind of people who are coming, you don't feel safe and all that. Once you know that, hey, they'll be using 11 Martin route. If you want, you leave, go somewhere, park your cars. You see, it just helps. That's a practical aspect. But it doesn't mean that it is the police that give permission. No, it's notification so that for security purposes, police can plan and also come and offer protection. Because sometimes you're on the demonstration and then there will be counter. And we haven't seen, even yeah, before in the, in the independence, that's why I saw that Ghana, we have a rich history. Even in the colonial times, you see group A wants to protest. The then group B comes. They think group A is protesting against. They too, they are they in are favor. Protesting. The trust, I saw it in the book. I was like, wow. So it didn't start today. No, no, it no, means no, that no, we no. just don't read. Uh -huh. So you see, so maybe group D too will come. 
So for security purposes, the police need to know so that they can plan, do intelligence checks and the rest. So, so that we all, you know, we all want to preserve our uh, peace and then our mm. lives. Yeah, so that's a, so practically it makes sense to inform the police. But please, it is not a permit. It's notification to them. So there are demonstrations that have gone on when uh, police have not been able to provide security. And that's where if you go and then you spoil things, uh, you, yes, they will arrest you and then causing damage to property and the rest. Mm -hmm. So Section 1 of uh, Act 491, the Public Order Act, says give notification. Give notification. So let's see the uh, general fundamental human rights. Uh, yes. uh, this, uh, uh, uh -huh. So Article 21, it says all persons shall have the right to, then D, freedom of assembly. Mm -hmm including freedom to take part in processions and demonstrations. So that's Article 21, Clause 1D. Okay, so that's it. That is it. You have a right to take part in demonstrations. Huh, but we've also seen that when you come to Article 12, they will tell you that, hey, as you enjoy your rights, but they they, they, they may infringe on others, so be careful. That's how they will popularly tell you that uh, this is your right to swing your arm ends where my nose starts or yeah. okay, begins. So if my nose is near and you swing <laughs> and you hit my nose, you see that in that popular American uh, saying that they go. So let's look at uh, this. Uh, um, uh, that, yes. So Article 12, all fundamental rights, blah, blah, shall be respected and upheld by the executive, legislature, and judiciary, all organs of government. Okay? Yes. So the point is that, please, let's make that very clear. It's not a permit. It's not. It's notification. But, and the law also says that the police can ask you to postpone, and they've been postponing, or modify the route. Yes. So those are also legal. But... Remember, it's, you can't ask people to modify the route in such a way as to make the demonstration nonsense that mm -hmm. people cannot see. So they will tell you the principle of sight and sound. So if the person, so you see this typical one, if the person says, I want to go towards Flagstaff House and get more mileage, more decent, and you tell me to face the sea, go towards the sea, where there are no, uh, this mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, what do you call it? People, there are no, uh, uh, what do you call it, dwellings, no economic activities. So you don't get traffic. People will not see, then it's wrong. So there's a principle of sight and sound when police want to relocate. Don't do it in such a way that you take the demonstration out of sight and out of sound. That's the principle that we, uh, as part of, so you won't get that stated in the law. Yeah. Those are in the decided cases. Yeah, Ghana, we haven't done sight and sound. Uh, expressly in the, the uh, but often if it informs the judges, we read from the UK Supreme Court, US, where they have been doing these demonstrations and they have, mm -hmm. till date, apart from the MPP and IGP, we don't yeah, have any other uh, Supreme Court decision on demonstrations. So sight and sound, we've not done in Ghana, but you check UK law, you check US, it's a very critical thing. Yeah. So when you are relocating them, and it's going to diminish the demonstration totally. The no, impact. People, the impact. People will resist. So you get middle ground. Okay. Yes. Then another one on education. You know, Ghanaians don't like guns. So as if we knew. So we wrote it in our uh, law. That's mm -hmm. this is what we call the Criminal Offenses Act. Its old name is the Criminal no, Code. Code. Yeah. And now it's called Criminal Offenses Act. Section 206 says that don't go to a demonstration with a, with a gun. Please don't. So let's read out. 206, subsection 2, it says, any person who, mm -hmm. while present at a public meeting mm -hmm. or at a public assembly of people mm -hmm. or on the occasion of a public procession mm -hmm. has an offensive weapon or missile mm -hmm. without lawful authority, mm -hmm. the proof of which lies on that person, mm -hmm. commits a misdemeanor. Yes. Mm -hmm. But without so lawful authority. Yes. What is the lawful authority? The lawful authority is that when you hold a gun as a Ghanaian, it must be registered. The police must have notice of it. Because the registration itself is done at the police. But, and but the, the police context are. must matter, man. Yeah, 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 no, no, the yeah, context yeah. matter. I'm just saying that. Yes. You see, so it doesn't mean that you are going, uh, 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 mm. then you can carry any gun. So on Kafu, but then you go and carry, then you are going. Because you see, when they are making such laws, they are not making it only for 
a certain group of people. It's general because this demonstration of public events could be happening in some village somewhere where they have, a, they have a lot of guns that have not been licensed. In that case, when you take it there, you are you committed this. Uh, mm. you know. But to the extent, and you see the way the police sought to deal with it. When uh, Mr. Kamba was found to be with the gun, the thing is that, oh, go and put it in your car. Mm. You, you, you understand? Because mm -hmm. they couldn't have arrested him there. Oh, not that they couldn't. We all know that. No, no I'm saying that. that because, is a big shot. You don't oh, no, What we are saying is that they said the proof is on him. Mm -hmm. So it means that when you say this gun is, I'm holding it legally, then you must prove that, yes, this is the basis of the yeah, reason why I'm saying This one, they will decide. We don't like you. No, no, what I'm saying is that, you see, you are looking at just, uh, we are looking at the law in this instance. I'm saying that mm -hmm. for his own security, then that uh, 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 burden is discharged. Okay. Now, let's, uh, Godfrey, let me ask something. Look, even ah, in the U.S., so like, let, take let, a yes, break even in the U.S., where they person. cherish the, what do you call it, the, the right position to carry in Ghana. Yeah. It's just last week, yeah. even if you Google yeah, it, the, last week or two, in Trump. New York, before the Supreme Court now gave an express ruling mm -hmm. that you can come with the gun outside for protection. Yes. So until that Supreme Court decision in the uh, U.S., just in the last one week, no, the gun, the, but that conceal it. So even this yes. one that I can yeah, don't see, but it. this one they saw, no, so oh. honorable, me, let me make my, my point is that look, holding a gun I saw that from the way I understand the law, the gun is meant to be in your house, your office, okay, places where you alone, you are with your family for your protection, not in public. And I'm saying that even in the U.S., where now the Supreme Court has said you can bring it out for protection. So I see what you mean. Maybe yeah. what you're trying to say is that, ah. If, if I'm coming out, I should come. But we don't have an express decision. And even that one, the U.S. one, where they say, now you can carry it along for protection. Say it should be concealed. Yeah, but concealed, yes. not open. So yes. I can't own was no, open. But, so, no, I can't own was in. It's just no, that you don't know, see in, yes, yes. in the confusion. Maybe yeah, somebody may have pulled him. Okay, all right. Yes, we'll we'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll hear from, from, it around, we'll hear, we'll hear from Dennis Miracles Abouaji, director LGD and R&D at the presidency. On the arrest, I'd ask him whether he went along on the demonstration. We we'll should be right back. Obra akoye sa power. Obo eni mna nyoda Daniel Chiri. Etoda se di wunu nuno. Yes, I'm not here. The obesu soon. Now, Diego, I call yesterday. I want to chat him. Debbie, we have a cost amount. Debbie, you should be a kangua. Me, you know, I'm no idea about how to manage now. I'm not doing it. I'm not betting. I see a sabio. The sisters are back with more chic and spice than ever. Beginning this July, join the League of Exceptional Sisters as they come to the rescue of relationships with the all-new season of Sister, Sister. Be it gut-wrenching personal secrets, jaw-dropping partner shenanigans, or the cringe-worthy deeds of family and friends, our sisters will be here to help you weave through the simplest and most complicated relationship issues. Catch the all-new season of Sister, Sister every Thursday at 7 p.m. on 97.3 City FM and Friday at 9 p.m. on City TV. Sister, Sister is sponsored by Kel Kids Toothpaste and the Ghana AIDS Commission. Welcome back to the big issue looking at the Arise Ghana demonstration that matters are rising. And um, Dennis Abwaji has also joined us as always. Um, Dennis, good morning. Hello, good Dennis. Morning. Good morning, Alfred. Ah, Dennis, good to hear you and see yeah. you. Uh, yeah. hope, hope you are well. The way you mentioned, 
the way you mention my portfolio, you start with LG, you know. It's <laughs> <I don't> know. <laughs> but but I have asked you this question in studio before. <laughs> you need to clarify that position you hold uh, at the oh, office of the president. Oh, oh, for a moment, for a moment, honorable Jodilo was going to wonder. Oh, yeah, that is your prophet because I indeed, <laughs> I indeed began to wonder. You what have happened? to, you, you have happened? to clarify that position you hold. Nobody knows the title. Save me by mentioning. By mentioning. Yes, yes, save me by mentioning director local governance at the office of the president. That's of local, local governance at the office of the president. Okay, all right, it's no problem. But then I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you paid attention to the protest of some Ghanaians this week regarding what they say uh, they're protesting against the untold hardships, high cost of living, and uh, s some of the incidents that arose out of that on day one. And then, of, of course, uh, the information minister's position that uh, he believes that there is an active strategy to cause instability in the country. Your thoughts on these matters? Yeah, then it's your thoughts on the matter. Okay, Kofi, let me say a very warm good. Let me say a very warm good morning to our viewers and my sincerest apologies to Honorable George Lowe and lawyer Martin Pibu for my inability to be physically present at the at the studio. I I see. Yes. Um, I had to do two things. I I I, I think that. Just as Lawyer Martin Pebble read out, we all have the right to protest and demonstrate and express our views as, as forceful as possible and as much as we can at every point in time. That, that is a basic right um, bestowed on us by, by, by the Constitution as, as citizens of this nation. The, the only thing we do not have is to... Um, protest and demonstrate in a way and manner in which other citizens who are not interested in our protest and demonstration will be affected. And I think that that, for me, is one of the issues that we need to begin to, you know, speak more of so that all of us will understand, will understand, will understand that point. Because I think a lot of us um, seem to be abusing this whole idea of my, the right to demonstration, the right to do this, the right to do that, without realizing that all these rights come with responsibilities, duties, and and certain ethics that, that we must live with. There is nobody in this country that has demonstrated, or there's no political party in this country that has demonstrated more than the, the MPP. Our four leaders since the 90s have been leading demonstrations to date. And indeed, even the current crop of MPP, as we have today, um, whilst we're in opposition, probably had more demonstrations than any other party has, has done in recent times. So there's no nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong with demonstrations, and nobody has an issue with, with demonstrations. The challenge we have with the um an attempt with the with the attempt of an insurgent, okay. That, that happened, was it on Tuesday or Monday with the Arise Ghana thing, is that it's the kind of protest or demonstration that we've never seen in, in, in recent history, if indeed it's even ever been in, in a part of our history. How so? That a group of people decide to go on a demonstration and they go with stones and rocks and gallons of fuel and car ties to, to the demonstration. The basic question anybody would ask is, what, what, was the, what was the reason for the decision to go to that demonstration with the, 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 the stones and the ties and, and the fuel? It, it basically tells you that there is a pre-determined um, or pre-planned pre you know, intention to, to cause mayhem. At, at, at the demonstration and at the protest. Indeed, um, if you recall, a few weeks to this particular demonstration, a group of people, which some of them they wanted to have a protest and a demonstration where they would go with guns, 
and go with machetes and and go with their own security for whatever reason we do not know and for which reason the courts and the police disagreed with them and indicated that indeed even though we run a democracy there are rules and regulations that we must work within and so they cannot be granted the room to have a demonstration with guns and and knives and machetes on on them and um, one of the funny thing was that they even wanted to have access they requested that they are granted access to the nation's broadcaster so they can give their own state of of the nation's address i i i think that that plan or that intention that they they had with the initial arrangement is what cascaded down to the rise ghana uh, 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 demonstration in fact the day before the demonstration the national communications officer of the ndc sami jenfi was on was on tv he had a one-on-one -on -one interview with johnny hughes on tv3 actually and and indicated that if the police um, attempt to do whatever it is that they are not happy with, then there's going to be a massacre on, on the day of, 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 of the demonstration. He those those were the exact words? Yes, those were the exact words. He, sa he said it on live TV. You can, you can, you can pick it from the, the, the Facebook wall. It was live on, on Facebook. I watched it live on, on Facebook. That there will be a massacre, you know, on, on, on the day if the police attempts to put impediments on their way. That's what he said. And, and said that they are going to have, have, have their way. F fast forward, the police disagreed with the time that they wanted to you know, have this protest and demonstration. They wanted to have it into the night. And the police was of the view that security-wise and for the safety of the citizenry and protection of property, it wasn't safe and they are unable to provide the level of security that they will require if the demonstration should run into the night. And so they went to court um, because the protesters or the, the, the conveners or the protest did not want to come to that agreement with the police. So the police had no other option but to go to court and got a, get a court um, declaration on the matter. The court indeed indicated that they can have the protest only between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. and also indicated the start off point and then the destination, which was the Obra spot, um, if I recall, and then the Independence Square. If you remember, initially, they wanted to go to the Jubilee House. Now, according to the police, when, when they got to the takeoff point of the demonstration, the protesters wanted to use the ring road to get to the Independence Square. And, and Godfrey, this is where we need to, we need to have clarity on on. on, on, on exactly what transpired. The police never said they would not allow them to protest because they had already con con converged at the, at the converging point. And the police never said they were, they were not going to allow them to go to the Independence Square. What the police said was that you can use an alternative road to the Independence Square, but not the ring road. You and I you know that when it comes to the ring road... No, no, independence. Second, please. Oh, okay. no, yes, on. Independence... Independence Square. Now, we all know that the Ring Road is a very, very busy road, especially any time after 2 p.m. And uh, if, if, if not managed well, it could cause so much disruption to life uh, of the citizens within, within the capital. And so if the police say that, why don't you use this alternative route so that we go to the Independence Square? I don't see why that should have degenerated into into any other thing because of course i am not a lawyer but i can read and write the the public order act as i have seen and and the senior lawyers are in the studio they can they can probably clarify section two clearly indicated indicates that the police person or the police personnel at the special events that is described in the in the act be it the protest or demonstration whatever it is when they realize that the particular route that you want to use, the particular route that you want to use, if you're allowed to use it, would cause disruption, disruption to the people or vehicular traffic. They have the mandate and the right to redirect you to use another route. This is in the law. And I don't think this particular um, um, clause in the act requires any court interpretation or court order. It is there, verbatim. 
clear, black and white, that the police personnel reserve that right on the day of this special event to direct you on an alternative route if, in their opinion, the route you intend to use can cause disruption and vehicular traffic. So if the police exercises this mandate that they have in the law and you disagree with them, it should not escalate into violence. Don't forget, whatever right you are also expressing at that point, you are drawing that right from another law. And so the same law that you are using to, to embark on your demonstration is giving the police another mandate to also ensure that they direct you in a way that other people are, so, are also not affected. Then you have a problem with it. Then you say that you would not agree. The route that you have decided to use is the only route that you would want to use. Indeed, if you look at the law, the law basically is telling the police that at any point in time in that event, when they feel that it could disrupt people or create vehicular traffic, they can redirect. So even if you have a pre-agreed route with the police, the law gives them room to change the route on the day of the event. The law even goes ahead to say that if in the opinion or the view of the police personnel, they feel that the, the special events, the protests or the demonstration could lead to violence, or it's violent, or it's about to become violent, they have the mandate or the right to disperse the crowd. It is there in the law, section two, control of the crowd. It is there. And if the police who are there to protect you and protect the protect protesters, and most importantly, protect the 29.999 million of us who are not part of this demonstration on this day, I'm telling you that you can still move from your destination to the, from your converging point to your destination as agreed and as directed by the court. But you cannot use this route. I don't see how this should, should, should disrupt, escalate into, into, into violence. And I keep hearing the NDC make reference to Kumi Preko demonstrations and all other demonstrations. The, the, the reason why some of us believe that this was an attempt of an insurgence, or it was an attempt to cause real in the capital city is simply because of all the demonstrations that we've had in the past. Usually, it is the protesters who complain about po police brutalities. I am yet to see or read any of the news or experience any protest in the past where protesters have gone out to beat police personnel, spelled stones at them, destroyed their vehicles in the manner in which the, the Arise Ghana demonstrators did in the last two or three days. Basically, they went out there to beat our men in black. That is what they did. They basically went out there with a predefined mentality that we are going to confront the police and we are going to beat them up. Girlfriend, tell me, of recent, of recent years, anything you have in memory of any of the protests where you have read or seen that police personnel have been beaten by protesters protesters, stones pelted at them, stones thrown at their vehicles, vehicles, windows broken, 12 policemen hospitalized after a protest in Ghana. Now, what would come into a mind, the mind of any sane citizen who says that I am going out there to express my protest and my view on a particular subject matter, but decides to go to this protest with a gallon of fuel? So, so, a so... Gallon. So I, I, I was going to try and ask you something, but I've run out of time on this. So thank you very much, Dennis Miracles. Thank you very much, uh, Lawyer Matipe, who and George Lowe. Uh, let me land well. Yeah, you, 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 you have 15 minutes to land, <laughs> yeah, don't but, worry. But he you have 15 minutes to land. He made some very yeah. inaccurate yeah. 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 Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, very inaccurate. My name is yeah. Godfrey Akutupo. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed yeah. this episode of The Big Issue. Have a good weekend.